So first of all, let me welcome you all here. Um, I, we the, the, the turnout and registrations for this event were uh, extremely high. And so if people end up getting uh, having to sit in the overflow space, I apologize for that. Um, but let me welcome you all. My name is Benjamin Wittes. I'm uh, the editor of Lawfare, uh, and uh, I, I help run the uh, working group uh, Hoover's Working Group on National Security, Technology, and Law. Um, and uh, this is the second in a set of events that Hoover and Lawfare have done with Intel uh, on uh, a variety of sort of privacy and cybersecurity related issues. Uh, so you've all seen the agenda, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, uh, introducing it, but the, the basic question that we're here to discuss today is uh, what should we expect uh, from in the current new legislative environment and new executive branch environment in, um, in the cybersecurity realm. And there is a lot of facets to that conversation. There's the policy facet. There's uh, the, uh, can, you know, there's the legislative gridlock facet. And there's also uh, this important overlay of what happened in the last election uh, that sort of colors the way a lot of people are thinking about uh, the entire environment. Uh, so I'm going to uh, basically uh, run traffic here today and, and let others uh, do the talking. Um, uh, but for our, our first uh, speaker, uh, who uh, I will introduce very briefly, is uh, Steve Grobman, who's the uh, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Intel Security, and uh, uh, which is, I think, shortly to be spun off as uh, once again as McAfee. I will let him uh, describe uh, what the relationship is between uh, Intel Security slash McAfee and Intel now and going forward. Uh, but he is um, the uh, chief, chief Technical Strategist and sort of moves the direction of the organization to create technologies that uh, protect computing devices uh, and infrastructure worldwide. Um, and he's uh, joined Intel in 1994 and has spent uh, more than two decades in senior technical leadership positions related to cybersecurity. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, a concept that Intel security and Intel more generally have been concerned about and talking about now for some time, which is this idea of a cybersecurity deficit and what it means to start paying it off uh, in, in policy and, and in money. Uh, he will uh, take questions, time permitting, um, and we will have a microphone that will come around. Uh, so if you have a question when he's ready to take questions, uh, please uh, wait until somebody comes around with the microphone before you ask it so that uh, the uh, webcast that is happening and the recordings that we're making uh, are able to get your question as well as his answer. So with that, I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, please join me in welcoming Steve Grobman. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ben. It's, it's a honor to be here. Uh, it's great that you put together distinguished panels. And Ben, I know you're a senior fellow in governance studies at, here at the Brookings Institute, uh, co-founder, editor-in-chief. Uh, of Lawfare blog and author of many books. And uh, it's great to be in company of such a strategic contributor. I'd also like to thank the Hoover Institution headquartered on the Stanford campus uh, back home for me in Silicon Valley. And it's an honor for me to give this keynote address on cybersecurity. Uh, I want to begin uh, by talking a little bit about how Intel security, soon to become McAfee, uh, sees cybersecurity threat landscape changing, evolving, growing. Uh, the industry must evolve. Uh, and what we want to offer in today's discussion is some very specific recommendations uh, to the new Trump administration. You know, when we think about the challenges that we face, uh, it's more significant than any single company is able to address on its own. Uh, the, the real challenge of cybersecurity is going to require leadership from Washington, uh, from public-private partnerships, and from the industry as a whole. And part of the issue is that the threat landscape 
is inherently ever-changing and complex. Uh, if you think about internet-enabled devices where there will soon be uh, hundreds of millions smart connected devices or new compute paradigms, things that we've seen in the past few ye years like cloud computing, these introduce new challenges to the security defenders in our industry, yet ultimately the job of the security practitioner hasn't changed. At the end of the day, it's about protecting vital services and data from theft, manipulation, or loss. Uh, due to external or internal adversaries. So while our mission hasn't changed, we do need to think about how the changes that are going on within the world that we live changes our job. Uh, we need to understand current, but also the forward-looking emerging threats. Uh, we need to learn how to think like the adversary. Uh, we need to be willing to embrace new models in order to defend these environments. We need to think about better ways to automate or use concepts like what we call human machine teaming, where you actually get the cybersecurity operators working seamlessly in conjunction with the technology. We need to be realistic and recognize that the attack surface continues to grow. And this means that not only organizations, but individuals are more vulnerable than ever and in more places. You know, adversaries are increasingly capable of attacking strategic assets and critical infrastructure. Uh, you know, traditional platforms that we're very familiar with, whether they're phones, tablets, laptops, servers, continue to be high value targets. But we also must expand our thinking to include all devices that are smart and connected. You know, modern computing, it runs our factories, it flies our planes, it drives our cars, and now it runs our homes. Almost every aspect of what our country runs on is potentially vulnerable to attack. We also need to think about the evolving motivation for cyber attacks, whether it's encrypting data, not to steal it, but to hold it for ransom, or to compromise a consumer electronic device for the purpose of converting it into part of the weaponry that a bad actor is to use. This last example, it's not science fiction. It's exactly what happened in October of uh, 2016, where we saw the Mirai botnet. Uh, this was where compromised consumer-grade IoT devices, things like uh, DVRs and home routers and cameras, were compromised and turned into attacking devices to go after Dyne, a internet provider that ultimately caused Twitter, Spotify, other major technical properties on the internet to be impacted. And the reason this is important is it really shows the leading edge of what's to come. Uh, if we think about other elements in our daily life, the future of autonomous transportation is in its infancy, but it relies on us getting the cybersecurity technology right now so that we're not standing here a decade later saying, why didn't we do a better job architecting the right capabilities into autonomous vehicles? So the net is you no longer need to sit at a computer or hold a smartphone in order to be a target of a cyber attack. We must not ignore the critical systems that run our companies, organizations, and government, and yet most organizations still lack the resources necessary to adequately monitor their networks or defend against sophisticated attacks. To overcome this overwhelming, ever-changing threat landscape, we must work together as a coalition. So we, we call this at McAfee Together is Power. This will be the tenant uh, to drive a force behind our new McAfee brand uh, that's currently planned to be a standalone company in just a few months. Uh, it's all about getting different elements to work together. It's about having technologies to work together by using things that we call open fabrics to be able to communicate. It's about enabling all of us in the cybersecurity industry to work together 
in ways that we've never thought as being feasible. And to be successful, we must understand the market-like forces that drive the effectiveness of cyber defense. What's fascinating about this is most IT technologies are very different from cybersecurity technologies. If you think about IT technologies, they get better over time. So if you think about networking or database systems or most applications, there's a constant state of evolution. Whereas what we see in cybersecurity technologies is a very interesting phenomenon where cybersecurity technologies are most effective during their initial inception. And the reason for this is they're built by looking at what the current problem statement is within the industry. But then as soon as the industry adopts new defensive capabilities and deploys them, bad actors create new countermeasures, evasion tactics, and ultimately the efficacy of these technologies declines. So the, the question this really leaves us with is where does it leave us? So if we see the, the current paradigm of constant integration of point products as being ineffective and unsustainable, what, what are we going to do when, when we not only see that the technology efficacy is declining in individual products, but also recognize the reality that most complex organizations require 30 or 40 independent tools and technology to protect their environments. It's, it's a losing game if we play by the existing rules. We need a fundamentally different approach. And this is where technology can be thought of a little bit differently. It needs to be thought of being rapidly developed, but then integrated into security platforms, platforms that can communicate over open communication protocols and work with operators that are able to work in this human machine teaming concept where they take the things that are very unique to human beings, that strategic intellect, and marry that with what technology is very good at. Uh, big data analytics, being able to work with information very rapidly that is collected from many different points throughout an organization. The key to having a winning cybersecurity strategy is to bring the technology, the cybersecurity industry, and the efforts ultimately between government and the private sector together. And when we say together is power, as our forward-looking statement of our mission and strategy, that's really what it's all about. So we need to look at what is working from a cybersecurity policy perspective. As we collaborate with our public partners, it's, it is important that we highlight some of the things that have worked well and also recognize how cybersecurity has changed over the years. Uh, it is a top-tier issue uh, for government leaders uh, really because of the recognized role uh, that it plays in IT systems that are paramount to national security, our economy, and the daily lives of citizens of the United States. Uh, a few bipartisan examples where we have had successes. First, the NIST framework. It lays out a clear roadmap uh, for organizations to evaluate and then enhance their cybersecurity readiness. Uh, second CISA, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, uh, where it improved the ability for public and private sectors to share threat intelligence while creating safeguards uh, for individual, personal, and private information. The information and analysis organizations and working groups, uh, really to be able to facilitate the key chain exchange of threat intelligence information uh, these efforts mirror something that we're doing in the private sector. Uh, a new organization that was launched a few years ago called the Cyber Threat Alliance, where a handful of competitors within the cybersecurity industry have come together in order to share information amongst us uh, in order to make the industry more secure and to allow all of us to do a better job in securing our customers. 
And fourth, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, so the most recent NDA urges uh, DOD to take an integrated approach in a wide range of security programs. It also shows the foresight and awareness in links between physical and digital world. Uh, that's very important if you think about some of the things that we talked about looking forward, not only related to critical infrastructure, but many of the evolving capabilities that will be in the lives of individual citizens. Uh, it also looks at other physical implementation, such as industrial control systems that are key to our critical infrastructure protection. And finally, CDM, uh, the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program, that DHS initiative, uh, really moving civilian government agencies and others from a compliance-based model to risk-based cybersecurity. So these and other cybersecurity initiatives helped create the initial building blocks that we can build from. So it's a great start, but we now need to look forward into what we would like the new administration to do. And I do apologize, I am getting over a cold if I sound a little hoarse. So our new administration must provide cybersecurity defense as a key area of focus. Uh, when President Trump was on the campaign trail, he said that cybersecurity is the fastest growing crime in the United States. He committed to making cybersecurity top tier policy and operational priorities for his new administration, and he pledged to improve the United States offensive and defensive cybersecurity capabilities. The new administration is already off to a good start. The draft executive order begins to operationalize candidate Trump's cybersecurity commitments. Our initial impressions are positive. Securing federal network systems. For too long, cybersecurity policies and operational outcomes have been delegated far down the management chain in government agencies, often with poor results. Uh, holding heads of government agencies responsible for cybersecurity outcomes in their agencies and putting OMB with its budget authority in a leadership position to drive accountability throughout government has potential to radically improve the security posture of government agencies. Directing government agencies to adopt the NIST framework is a sensible policy. The framework was developed in collaborative manner between government and private sector, and it's been a useful de facto standard. Modernizing federal IT, the order directs agency leaders to plan and execute a deliberate modernization of federal executive branch IT. This is critically needed. As legacy systems lack the ability of modern security architectures to inherently be secure, you can only take a legacy system and patch it, wrap it, isolate it to such an extent you ultimately are unable to create the same level of cybersecurity defense that you could with a new modern system. And the reason for this is the new modern development tools, development methodologies, and building blocks provide an inherently more secure level of capability than you're able to achieve than taking a legacy system and trying to adapt it. A good analogy is if you think about other elements of our physical infrastructure. Uh, I live in California, and uh, as some of you may know, the Oakland Bay Bridge has recently gone under some major renovations. And if you look at the bridge, it had two sides to it. It had a side that they were able to retrofit in order to be adequate to withstand earthquakes that are potentially going to hit the region. But the other side of the bridge, there was no way to adapt the existing technology. And it actually required a new development methodology, a new construction of a new bridge. And that is a good way to think about what we must do with federal systems. There will be some areas that we can continue to shore up and patch to get us by. But in some cases, we will need to go to modern construction techniques, in this case, of the cybersecurity variety in order to really be ready for the security challenges of 2017 and beyond. So if properly managed and funded, this draft order would enable 
the retirement, replacement, and modernization of legacy IT that is difficult to secure and expensive to maintain. Uh, these actions are critical, long overdue, steps that will help secure and make government IT systems more efficient and cost effective to run. But not modernizing will ultimately lead to larger costs. Uh, to deal with breaches reactively. So the, the important point here is there is a clear ROI in rebuilding and modernizing our federal systems, but we also must recognize the cost of not doing it, not only in cost of running the legacy systems, but in the cost of dealing with the breaches that are sure to occur. The OPM hack is a perfect example. It had immense economic and non-economic consequences. The economic costs alone are enormous. Uh, rebuilding OPM, state and defense IT infrastructure, $650 million. Uh, notifying and protecting identities for federal employees, $133 million to $500 million. But it's the non-economic costs, the threat that adversaries can cross-check personal data on, a, on our most sensitive government employees that imposes the most significant long-term cost to our country. So this one incident having over a billion dollars of financial impact and immeasurable cost in the impact to our national security is just one example of what will be more to come if we don't move forward with modernizing our IT systems. We need to secure our critical infrastructure. Uh, the draft order directs the Secretary of Homeland Security and agency heads to identify federal authorities and capabilities needed to come up with a plan to help critical infrastructure companies secure themselves. So if properly managed and executed in a voluntary manner with the private sector prote to protect the most critical of critical infrastructure, such as core communication, infrastructure, and power grid, much good could come from this directive. The draft executive order uses the same definition of critical infrastructure, Section 9 companies, used by the Obama administration that excluded information technology companies from enhanced regulatory exposure. Uh, continuing this policy makes sense to ensure that America's IT companies can continue to innovate in a quickly changing global market. Once we have seen the final order, we'll be able to we'll be in a position to give it a lengthy review and finalize our position on it. Finally, the administration has moved quickly to make some strong personal appointments. Tom Bozert as Homeland Security Advisor, Joshua Steinman to lead the National Security Council cybersecurity effort, and Rudy Giuliani to chair the White House Cybersecurity Task Force. Congress has also acted to confirm new leaders of our Defense Homeland Security and, to def and Intelligence Departments with impressive cybersecurity credentials. We expect to work closely with these people and others to offer the best perspective they need so they can make the best decisions. While as we've seen, the security landscape is constantly changing, we believe there are some high-level recommendations we can make right now. First, as the Trump administration reviews its options for supporting the multi-stakeholder process to ensure the internet remains valuable, reliable, and secure, we urge the administration to focus on establishing international norms and standards in cyberspace. From hacktivists to cyber cr criminals, the threat landscape is global, and our policy must respond in such a manner. Where we have good tools in the US, such as the NIST framework, we should work to disseminate them globally. Other nations have already taken an interest in this common sense tool that focuses on risk management rather than static compliance and embodies the public-private partnership necessary to help transform cybersecurity on a global scale. Second, the Trump administration must establish a secure e-government, as it is said it will do. There is no reason citizens should stand in long lines at government service offices or wait on phones 
in the age of e-government. So far, however, major hacks have not inspired confidence in the security of civilian government systems and data. Citizens need to trust the digital interactions with government to fully realize the promise of e-government, which can also reduce operating costs and create efficiencies for government agencies. Government systems need to have comprehensive end-to-end -end cybersecurity, and citizens need the provided tools such as digital certificates, secure IDs, and encryption to enable more secure interactions with government. Third, the administration will need to solidify its information sharing strategy. Sharing of threat intelligence information has been a necessity since I started in cybersecurity, yet we still haven't locked down the standards and processes for doing so in a meaningful way. DHS and its working groups have created a path to get there, but we're not far enough along the way. We need to recognize the reality around the challenges of threat intelligence. Threat intelligence suffers from what we call the free rider problem. This means that threat intelligence is something that everyone wants to consume, yet there's very little incentive to publish or give. And then due to its nature, if there's no incentive for individual organizations or bodies to contribute to a threat intelligence pool, there's nothing in the pool to receive. So overcoming this inherent market-driven condition is something that we will need to work through through a strong partnership in order to make sure that there is value in providing information in order to drive the aggregate good. The Trump administration should double down with the private sector to further evolve the way cyber threat information is represented and transported. Cyber criminals, they're excellent at information sharing. The government and private sector ought to be too. Fourth, the administration must maintain a voluntary engagement on securing critical infrastructure. Historically, cyber threats remained in the digital world. Data was stolen or held for ransom. Networks are breached or brought down. Systems were infected by malware. These exploits were bad enough, but now we see cyber attacks are moving into the physical realm. As the Internet of Things has exponentially expanded opportunities for hackers to infiltrate more than just the digital world, we've seen attacks on dams and other critical infrastructures. As I've mentioned, it's not just about attacking devices to inflict damage on the device itself, but also to convert the device into an asset for the attacker. The federal government has a legitimate interest in making sure critical infrastructure is secure, but the private sector must continue to lead without regulatory mandates, lest regulatory substitutes compliance for real security. As a new administration works on fundamental tax reform, it should consider granting critical infrastructure companies tax benefits, possibly refundable tax credits, to incentivize them to shore up their cyber defenses. Positive incentives rather than punitive regulations will help produce real results. The other challenge that we see related to regulation is the opportunity cost of being compliant with a regulation will often detract from the ability to concentrate on the most significant risks of the day. By focusing on the highest profile risks will ultimately enable the private sector to provide the most secure foundation for the critical infrastructure and other key capabilities. Fifth and probably the most important recommendation for the Trump administration is investment in cybersecurity as a foundational piece of his larger infrastructure build out. We urge the new, area, the new administration to double down on its commitments in this area. Investments start with cyber education and training. One piece of the cyber debt that's been ignored is developing the next generation of cybersecurity experts. A report we conducted with the Center for Strategic and International Studies found that a majority of IT professionals around the world think their government is not investing enough in building cybersecurity talent and that the skill shortage results in measurable damage. 
we recommend an even larger financial investment in existing federal workforce and education programs to showcase a diversity of career paths for interested students and then coordinating these initiatives with the private sector. For instance, the Cyber Corps Scholarship for Services program. It trains students and places them in government jobs for just a few years, equipping them to pursue a cybersecurity career wherever they want. The program is ideal for students looking to pay back their scholarships up front with two or three years in federal service. But for students interested in serving their government while jumpstarting a career in the private sector, creating alternate paths to scholarship repayment could also bring more talent to bear. To that end, we recommend the government consider the creation of a Cyber National Guard program. At the state and federal level, an expanded SFS or SFS style grant program could train and educate a new class of cyber practitioners prepared to serve government on a full-time, part-time, or as-needed basis while gaining critical experience with the latest private sector innovators. We in the private sector must also be prepared to level up our collaboration with government to ensure a steady supply of worthwhile internships, co-ops, and training opportunities. In the CSIS report, a lack of quality training opportunities was cited as a significant reason why cyber practitioners seek alternative employment. So we must work together to make sure the best talent is not exclusive to our industry, but we're willing to open to support the government in promoting cybersecurity. Investing in education and training is one thing, but we also must invest in paying down the cyber debt in other ways. As IT innovation has accelerated and technology has assumed a dominant place in our lives and economy, we have invested too little in cybersecurity, particularly in the IT and industrial control systems that protect the most critical infrastructure the federal government has with each passing day, agencies have become further exposed to more cyber breaches. Because of the cyber debt, the ever-widening gap between investments necessary to secure our growing digital world and the resources actually deployed to do so, we're playing catch up. And we still have years of cyber debt to pay down. The Office of Management and Budget says nearly 80% of federal IT spending planned for the next fiscal year targets legacy systems. 78% or about $63 billion of the $82 billion uh, for fiscal year 2017 IT budgets. Most of this spending is for maintaining and upgrading current IT infrastructure. Far too many of these federal IT systems are vulnerable to cybersecurity risks because they were not designed to make use of modern security best practices. And development methodologies and other ways that modern architectures and systems are built are key in retooling these underlying systems, which in some cases will require entire replacement cycles. And that is why we are so pleased that the administration is making this a top priority. The administration should work with Congress to fund the significant IT modernization plan he has announced. At the same time, the administration should help states address their own cybersecurity vulnerabilities. DHS and other programs are going to be key to facilitating bringing these defenses forward and online. And finally, encryption policy is of particular importance to us. Intel Security respects and is grateful for the tireless work of the public servants who further law enforcement and protect national security. As a technology company, we are committed to assisting both government and law enforcement in the battle against cybercrime. We and other technology companies have a long history of responding to lawful demands for information from government agencies. However, we remain aligned with most technology companies and leaders around privacy and other key elements that also impact this very challenging issue. The privacy community is working with issues that they believe there are big challenges in creating backdoors or other key escrow-based solutions into products. And 
we must recognize that in order to really look at encryption policy, we need to test whether we're solving the problem with the solution that is being recommended or stated. So the problem statement that we all agree on is we desire law enforcement to be able to get access to information that is being held by terrorists or other criminal actors. Encryption makes that hard. But the question that I ask is, does creating mandates on devices that would create backdoors or require other key escrow and capabilities actually solve that problem? I would argue no. I would argue that based on the nature of encryption, where it's ultimately just math, and bad actors that are motivated to securely encrypt data that is not accessible by law enforcement can do so by downloading readily available open source or readily available applications globally and encrypt that data in such a way that regardless of what is done on a device level, law enforcement would not be able to access the underlying data. So I would ask, have we done anything other than damage the privacy challenges of the non-criminal and bad actor community? The US government attempts to mandate technology feature decreases Americans, companies to re resist attempts by other governments to regulate products as well. Uh, we need to recognize that the United States leads by examples and what comes down as a mandate in this country can be repurposed by other countries to ultimately place devices and the citizens of the United States at greater risk as opposed to reduced risk. We know the Trump administration is committed to strengthening our national cybersecurity capabilities. We at McAfee and the rest of the industry, we're all fighting for the same thing, to, to defeat the cyber enemy. Whether they're hacktivists, cyber criminals, or nation states, we can't do it alone. We need continued technology innovation, a tightly integrated fabric to make these innovations actually useful across the security industry and the public-private partnerships that we have begun to move us forward. What that's really all about is this concept of together is power. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has. You talked about um, making the heads of the agencies personally accountable, but I, I find it hard to believe that these head of agencies are going to have any experience in cybersecurity to be able to do a good job. So the way that I would equate it is I don't see it being any different than a CEO in the private sector. If you're a CEO of a pharmaceutical company, you likely don't have any expertise in the mechanics of cybersecurity either, but yet you're able to accept the risk that cybersecurity imposes on your organization, and you're able to learn about the most critical elements of cybersecurity in order to ensure that risk has been mitigated to the extent that you're comfortable for your shareholders and board. I think that is a reasonable level for us to hold agency heads to as well. Uh, you mentioned in the executive order, the executive order use of, uh, oh, thank you, of section nine, um, uh, critical infrastructure companies, but doesn't it also sort of create this new, the draft uh, that Paul Rosenzweig posted to uh, create this new category of core communications infrastructure that but, I mean, it seems to be a completely new concept. Uh, you know, it might include uh, your parent uh, entity. Uh, can you talk about that a bit? Sure. I, I think there are uh, two things that, that I would say. Uh, number one, a lot of the infrastructure that we have in place from the original Internet was never built to withstand the cyber attacks that we see today. I think the dying attack in October is a great example of that. Uh, the domain name system that translates domain names into IP addresses never comprehended distributed denial of service attacks and ultimately uh, that made it a lot easier for the adversaries. I caution though 
against getting too aggressive to move to a clean slate without always ensuring that pragmatism trumps all, no, no pun intended. Uh, and the example I'll give is look at IP version 6. That was intended to overcome some of the deficiencies that we had with IPv4. It's 20 years later, and we still don't have IPv6 deployed. Uh, so we do need to look at retooling some of the key communication capabilities, but at the same time, we need to do so with an eye towards pragmatism. And with that, I will turn it back to Ben, and I apologize if I ran over. No worries. Please join me in thanking Steve Grobman. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Josh Gerstein. I'm a senior White House reporter with Politico. Thanks for uh, coming out in this first part of the, um, the first panel discussion after our uh, kickoff address there from Steve. Um, I think when, when Ben asked me to moderate this panel, it was a few weeks ago, and we probably all thought we would have, if not clarity, um, a little more definition in where the Trump administration was headed in the cybersecurity area, as well as probably a bunch of other uh, national security areas. Um, even before the inauguration, there was a meeting with the tech executives um, up, up at uh, Trump Tower, and it seemed to, even though there were some uh, tensions or some areas where they had not seen eye to eye, I'm sure most of the people in the room were not Trump supporters, there seemed to be a cordiality there and a willingness to go forward. Uh, since then, there's been an extremely uh, chaotic environment uh, at the White House. Um, you know, a good person to ask about where the cyber policy is headed would be the National Security Advisor, and that would actually uh, be a different person uh, as of a few weeks ago versus, say, uh, yesterday. The new National Security Advisor apparently started work uh, at noon. Some of the personnel assignments in this area, I think, are arguably in flux, given that um, General McMaster has been told he has complete authority to uh, reassign anyone uh, across the operation. So uh, I also saw a headline on our site at Politico just within the last day or so that about three dozen of the 550 most significant policy jobs in the administration uh, that are Senate confirmable have been named at this point. So probably uh, over 90 percent are still uh, waiting to come forward. Um, so. There's also one other thing that we seemed clearer at the beginning and now is not that clear. It was mentioned earlier the, the cybersecurity uh, order that President Trump, uh, it may have sounded to some folks like President Trump signed a cybersecurity order. In fact, we were all told as journalists that he was going to do that um, on January 31st. And then within just hours of being told he was going to do that, uh, the White House abruptly changed course. And this draft that was released a few weeks ago um, has not yet. Uh, been signed, presumably the new National Security Advisor uh, will want to take a, a look at it before uh, it actually goes out the door. So there's been a fair amount of um, tumult and uncertainty surrounding uh, cybersecurity as well as a number of other uh, security uh, areas. Um, I thought we would uh, start with our panel. Uh, it's tempting to go straight to Jeff and ask Jeff, since he's probably the closest connected to the Trump administration. Um, you know, what the heck is going on, but I don't want to put him quite in that hot seat. So I thought we would start um, with Denise uh, Jung, who comes from CSIS, who works on cyber and emerging technology issues there. Um, she previously worked as a chief of staff at uh, DARPA, the Defense, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency that many of you are probably uh, familiar with and with a company called uh, CA Technologies and previously worked on the Hill um, in the Senate. So I thought we would start with Denise for a quick lay down of, if we can't say what the Trump administration is going to do, what problems uh, the Trump administration should be looking to tackle in the cybersecurity area. And then we'll turn to Jeff to see um, what ideas he's heard about being floated. Denise, you want to get us started? Sure. So um, thanks, Lawfare, and thanks to Hoover for having me here on this panel today. Um, you know, with so many different um, issues dominating the agenda at this time, from the travel ban to the replacement of the National Security Advisor to um, you know, efforts to repeal and replace Obamacare. Um, cyber policy issues seem to have sort of fallen off of the priority list, I think. Um, and I think this is actually completely natural and normal for the first 100 days of any new administration, especially one that is, um, you know, uh, has ran on a platform that is so different in approach from 
uh, the previous administration in terms of, of direction and domestic policy and foreign policy issues. The immediate focus has obviously been on um, policy initiatives that the Trump administration believes will probably deliver the greatest political dividends for you know the, the base of supporters that, that voted them into office. So that sort of leaves us with you know the less um, you know with, in terms of cyber for Trump and his inner circle, it's it's a, a very complicated issue um, without sort of a clear politically expedient path forward. So when you think about it, the biggest issue du jour for cyber is really the, the Russia hacking um, incident and influence operations, these sorts of things. And understandably, this is a tough issue for the Trump administration to weigh in on at this time. So that kind of leaves us with these less sexy but still important cyber issues primarily related to the roles and responsibilities of various federal government agencies, how the government should improve its own cybersecurity, the org chart for um, the military in terms of cyber command and NSA, those sorts of things. And I would argue that that's probably in part, at least, why the executive order has yet to be signed. So if we look a few months out into the administration, perhaps after things have se settled a bit, what are the big ticket items for, for Trump on cyber? Um, I think many folks, including myself, are sort of scratching our heads, thinking, um, you know, wondering what that might be. But one way to, to sort of think about answering this question is to maybe look at things that, that I think the Trump administration is unlikely to do. Um, and one of those things is, is, is regulation. It's clear that the, that the administration and an overwhelming majority of the GOP really has no appetite for a regulatory approach to cybersecurity. Um, you know, although we talk about having a voluntary approach based on the NIST framework, the truth is that over the past few years, a lot of the sector-specific agencies have promulgated new rules. And I think, you know, there's this question about whether or not those rules may be rolled back, uh, whether efforts to come up with new regs may be sort of put on hold. Um, you know, and. Just because the administration is doing this, however, doesn't necessarily mean that states um, aren't going are going are going to follow suit. I think there's a lot of interest in cybersecurity um, and developing new standards and regs at the state level, particularly uh, New York, um, maybe Massachusetts, California, uh, where there are sort of ongoing legislative efforts on the side. Um, New York just promulgated new rules for cybersecurity applicable to the financial services industry, applicable to banks. Um, so I think along similar lines, it's, it's very possible that um, some agencies that were given a larger role for cyber under the Obama administration may see sort of a diminished or refocused role for cyber under, under Trump. And one potential example of that is DHS, um, you know, and this is sort of me just reading the tea leaves, but I think DHS is going to be very much more focused on border issues. I'm curious to hear what Jeff has to think about that. On the international side, um, you know, I think it's hard for me to imagine that our international engagement strategy on internet and cyber policy issues will continue to be focused on sort of internet freedom driven by a human rights um, focused agenda. I think the focus will probably be more on security and resilience in terms of international engagement. Things like cyber incident response at a sort of international level, on law enforcement cooperation on cyber crime, on combating um, IP theft and commercial espionage, those sorts of things. So those are things that I think the Trump administration is likely to not do on cyber. Um, I think it's also helpful to identify some cyber issues that the administration will have to get pretty smart on very quickly. Um, these are issues that are not necessarily front and center right now, but they will become challenging over the next year or so, um, where a path forward for, for Trump is not so clear because of conflicting principles and priorities in terms of, you know, a pro-business ideology, but also potentially a trade a more protectionist trade agenda. Digital trade and cross-border data flows is, is a prime example of this. 
So um, when you look around the world, you see that established markets, emerging markets, uh, China and India in particular, are taking a more localized approach to digital trade. So they're you know, increasingly requiring companies to localize data, uh, to localize infrastructure, uh, restrict cross-border data flows, and in some cases require pretty stringent security reviews, such as uh, source code disclosure, just to get access to their market. And I think um, to date our policy has been to sort of fight back on, on, on those um, trends, um, but I think that the question remains whether, you know, under a Trump administration, um, there could be sort of reciprocity on our end. Um, the durability of the privacy shield is, a, is another uh, uh, unknown at this time. It depends a lot on, you know, re reauthorization of Section 702 of uh, FISA and um, whether or not things like the Presidential Policy Directive 28, which set forth sort of a number of um, surveillance, um, electronic surveillance reforms post Snowden will persist under the new administration. So these are sort of a sampling of issues and I think that um, you know my fellow panelists will go deeper into some of them and I'm sure that we'll have time to cover in Q&A as well. Um, thanks Denise, I th there's a couple of things I'd love to pick up on there but given the um, tight schedule, why don't we jump to Jeffrey. Um, Denise did a pretty good job laying out, at least on the cybersecurity front, some of the challenges, policy decisions um, that are ahead. Uh, let me just introduce Jeffrey before he starts speaking. Um, he's a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, has previously worked at the Federal Trade Commission and the Office of Management um, and Budget. He focuses on technology issues as well as um, innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, maintaining a vital and robust private sector and, and uh, competition issues. He's also a senior vice president at NERA Economic Consulting and teaches at George Mason um, Law School. So Jeffrey, um, help. I'm sure everybody in the room is desperate to get inside the room, uh, the room down the street and the other rooms across Washington where the Trump administration is doing whatever it's doing, be it on cybersecurity or anything else. Um, tell, give us your best insight as to what you think is going on and does it correspond in any way to, to what you saw when you were uh, on the transition team at the FCC and working on some of these cyber issues? Take, take it away. Well, th thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Hoover and the great work that's, that's done here uh, uh, and to Lawfare um, and, uh, you know, a great, a great read uh, and uh, I think the first source of the current draft of the cyber order. Um, so um, uh, so uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Let, let me just be clear. I did serve on the Trump transition team that ended on January 20th, uh, mercifully, uh, since I have too many other jobs. Uh, and I'm not here speaking for anybody other than me. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm really going to speak probably more to uh, the question of should then necessarily will, uh, although um, I was part of conversations during the transition there, and I think it's important just as, as context to realize that while there are not a lot of people in named positions today, and that is a challenge and a problem, um, and you can point to the Hill or you can point to the White House, or uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, the appointments process has been slow. Uh, and I think it's fair for people to say who's in charge. Uh, and the National Security Advisor issue, obviously, uh, have, making a switch there at this point, you know, not the first thing you'd want to do. So, uh, but having said that, you know, I think it would be wrong to think that the people engaged in thinking about cyber policy uh, around the president, around the White House, around the Trump administration are less than, um, uh, you know, less than competent or less than fluent uh, in the issues. So, you know, people like Kyron Skinner, people like Karen Evans, uh, the folks who were engaged in the work that really brought me here today at the American Enterprise Institute, putting together a, a, a report we released last year on an American strategy for cyberspace. You know, a lot of people have been engaged in advising and helping to develop and talking with folks in the Trump administration. And I would expect, not any of the names I just said necessarily, but uh, I would expect that people will end up in those positions uh, who uh, are people who 
uh, people in this room know and respect. And I, and I think maybe that's the, the first thing I want to say and, and maybe the main thing I want to say in terms of predictions. Um, and, and that is what you see when you look at the cyber executive order more than anything else is continuity. And I think other people have, have commented on this, both of the versions um, that, that were out, the first version and the second version, you know, speak more than anything else to, to continuity. Uh, and uh, as you know, as I've, as I've looked at this issue, and I think others, you know, there was a lot about what the Obama administration did in this arena uh, that uh, I, as someone who follows technology policy and cares about these issues, uh, felt good about, and, and that many other people, this was not an issue where there was a deep partisan divide or ideological divide. Uh, the issue went to execution. And I, and I think, again, many people in this room, if you talk to people in the Obama White House or the Obama cyber uh, world during the course of the last year of the administration or so, I think they were painfully aware uh, that there was a gap between the vision and the execution. So, and, and I don't say that to place blame, uh, just uh, that last year of administration, tough to get stuff done, understood, and rapidly evolving environment. So, uh, I think number one, we're looking at, you know, not dramatic change in this arena. Having put that on the table, uh, let me now take it to you know, take it up a level, which is the the work we did at AEI and the way that I think it's helpful to think about all these issues. And what I want to try to do is 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 a kind of lay out a framework for, and this is the framework we we use came up with at AEI, um, which is a very broad strategic framework, a holistic framework for thinking about cyber strategy as opposed to cyber security. Uh, and then from that, uh, let me, I'll talk about a few aspects of that and then, and then just speculate a little bit on how uh, the Trump administration might deal with them. So uh, to begin with, you know, cyber is everywhere. It's, it, 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 I, th I think um, Steve spoke to this. You know, cyber runs our cars, our electric plants. It, it's broken out of, it's not the internet. Cyber is the air we breathe. It's, it's gravity, right? It defines the way our world functions. Right? So as you're thinking about cyber, you're thinking about, I believe today, the ultimate source of power. And it is, the, it is what now literally controls our physical universe, uh, in, you know, other than the air and the gravity. Right? So much of, what we, of the environment in which we live is controlled through cyber. It's the intersection between the information world and the kinetic world is substantially complete and getting deeper. Right? So, so in thinking about that, I think cyber has to be top of mind for any view of United States global strategy over the long run. If you're not thinking about cyber first, I, I, I don't know what you should be thinking about. As we thought about that, we broke the problem down then into four elements, and, and I'm going to talk very briefly about each of them. Law, law enforcement, which I include everything from you know, identity theft to ransomware, uh, critical infrastructure and cyber war trade, and then information warfare and speech. Right, so let's, let's talk about all, and I'll, I'll just hit these each very briefly, I'll be done. Um, you know, on law enforcement, I think the main point, and, 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 and one context for all of these is, if you're not thinking about all of these things globally, you're not thinking about them at all. Right? Not, none of the issues I just described is in any meaningful way circumscribed by any geographic border anywhere. So you, you can't think about, you know, what do we do about cybercrime in the United States? It's a, it's a silly question. Um, so, so all of these things have to be thought about globally. So, so let's just walk down, uh, let's, let's walk down the list. With, with respect to law enforcement, I, I think the main thing that, you know, I put on the table is just that the ties that bind international law enforcement agencies are not affected by the number of people holding placards outside of Parliament, out, outside of Westminster, uh, arguing that the President shouldn't be allowed to come speak before Parliament. Right? If you talk to people in the law enforcement community, they are doing their jobs. They are collaborating and cooperating on an international scale, just the way they were on January 19th. And there, I think there's no reasonable basis for thinking that that's not going to continue. I think it's important in general here to try to separate the noise from the substance, the whatever you want to call it, reaction to Trump from the reality of what's happening on the ground. If, just, if you want to see the world as it is, I think that's an important first step to do that. And it's not, it's not that the reaction isn't important in its own way, but it doesn't affect everything. Uh, number one. So, so I think in that context, 
there, there is a lot of need for progress in terms of uh, a better capacity for international law enforcement to collaborate across international borders. I don't see any reason to think. I think that was recognized by the Obama administration. I think it's recognized by this administration. It gets recognized by the professionals. I think there's every reason to think it'll happen, number one. Um, critical infrastructure and cyber war. Uh, th this, in a way, is, is maybe the one, <laughs> the one exception to the everything is global. Obviously, the understanding threats part is global, but the protecting the electric grid in the United States is <laughs> a US issue. You know, there, I think, I would pay attention to both versions of the executive order, to the focus on the Section 9 agencies, to the gap that I think everybody recognizes between the capacity to bring to bear the power of the United States government in cyber defense and the reality of the ability to do that, right? So the existing framework is one which, frankly, just does there is too much friction between the ability to bring uh, NSA's capabilities to bear, not just in information sharing, but operationally, to protect against potentially catastrophic, serious threats to critical infrastructure across the board. I think you're going to see efforts to see one way or another that gap bridged. And I think that's what, I, you know, Section 9 can be thought of as a regulatory vehicle or it can be thought of as an operational vehicle. I think we all worry about the regulatory aspect of that. Uh, you know, having someone at NSA or a, a, a Homeland uh, Defense um, uh, you know, dictating cybersecurity infrastructures or choices via regulation or otherwise to the private sector doesn't sound like a very good idea probably to anybody in this room. But bringing to bear on an operational level the capacity of the United States government, including the full capacity of our intelligence gathering capabilities uh, to uh, cyber defense, real-time cyber defense, I think that's a problem we're going to see the Trump administration try to solve. I think it's a problem that the Obama administration knew needed to be addressed. Um, on the trade front, you know, why trade? You know, at the end of the day, America's uh, top asset uh, in all aspects of cyber policy and cyber power is the superiority of American companies. So we, we all to have, and maybe most of us still do, take for granted that cyber means Apple, Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google. That's a result of a 25-year-old first mover advantage, and we would be silly to take it for granted. The largest cell phone infrastructure in the world, cell phone, smartphone infrastructure, mobile broadband infrastructure in the world today, by a large measure, is China Mobile. If we think our ability to continue dictating technologies and through technologies, capabilities, and policies, and ultimately policy decisions, um, is something we can take for granted because we own the cyber commercial universe, that's not something I think we ought to take for granted. Now, on, on that front, I think the fact that the uh, Trump administration is taking a more realistic, I would say, uh, you call it differently if you like, view of our relationships with uh, uh, trading partners and adversaries like China is extremely healthy. The Chinese are engaged, and not just the Chinese, in aggressive policies of digital mercantilism designed to deny markets to American companies, to design, to, de to uh, um, deny the ability of American companies and other Western companies to take advantage of the economies of scope and scale, which are essential to success. Right? Bottom line is, if U.S. companies can't operate in China, U.S. companies are at risk of no longer being able, of no longer being dominant as we take for granted that they are. And that's, that is a long run and uh, I think existential threat to America's ability to control its destiny in cyber policy and cyber power. Uh, I think that uh, Chinese investment in U.S. technology companies is extremely strategic and designed, I think, if uh, designed basically on the theory that if you can't steal it, you buy it. Um, steal it is easier, buy it if you have to. Um, but our ability to continue, and I'm, I'm in favor of all of that, as long as it's a two-way street. 
Uh, but what we are experiencing with China is, I think the Trump folks have figured it correctly. Not in favor of the stealing part. Well, not in favor, not in, obviously not in favor of the stealing part either way. Uh, but the trade part, obviously, um, you know, we ought to be in favor of, but it's got to be a two-way street and it's not. And then lastly, and uh, one more minute and I'm done, um, we are engaged, and I, you know, I think the Russian um, hack in the U.S. election has really kind of taken the lid off uh, information warfare in the 21st century. We're engaged in a global battle for hearts and minds that we haven't seen anything like since the Cold War. During the Cold War, we were very actively engaged in that battle. We recognized that the United States had an interest in promoting shared values of democracy, individual liberty, uh, freedom, property rights, capitalism, that we, that, that we had a shared interest in promoting those values and advocating those values and calling out efforts to undermine those values, and we did that aggressively. Now, the, someone mentioned the National Defense, Steve mentioned the National Defense Authorization Act. Very important aspect of that was the um, statutory authorization of the Global Engagement Center and the expansion of its mission beyond ISIS to global information warfare in general, right? So I think as you look at the State Department, you know, we're, we're spending $775 million today on the, quote, Broadcasting Board of Governors, which is a, just a funny name for an agency, um, uh, which is doing a little bit of uh, um, 21st century media and an awful lot of television broadcasting, right? I think what you will see at the, at the State Department, I hope what you will see at the State Department is an effort to modernize that entire effort and to expand that entire effort, not to you know, engage in propaganda so much, but to do what, uh, do what we did for a long time, which is to call out untruthful information <coughs> and uh, from Russia or any place else, from the troll houses uh, or the 50 cent army, um, to call out that information and make sure that American values are seen, at least have a fighting chance to be understood around the world. So that's a very broad agenda. Obviously, I think it's the reality that that's the world which confronts the Trump administration. I think the Trump administration will react to that reality because it doesn't have a choice to. Uh, and ultimately, that's what administrations do. You know, you think you come in with an agenda, but the reality is most days in the White House, it tells, the world tells you what you're doing today. Um, and I think those things will likely be telling the Trump administration um, what to, part of what it's got to pay attention to over the course of the next uh, four years. Um, Jeff, let me just follow up with a couple quick questions. Um, one is, uh, you know, you mentioned the controversy over Russia information operations, the election hacking, the uh, back and forth we've seen with, with General Flynn and others over the last few, few months. I mean, what vectors do you see coming out of that controversy pressing on the administration to do things, if you see any, to do things have different points of emphasis in the cyber realm as a result of that. And let me also couple that with another question, which is that we've seen Trump's apparent preference for military leadership now um, in the selection of four proposed national security advisors, two of whom have actually held the title now in the last um, 30 days, all sort of seeming to be drawn from the ranks of the military. What does that prefer, do you think that's a real preference? And what does that portend for this national security agency, DOD, DHS debate, back and forth, yin yang situation we've been in for more than, what, about a decade now on the cybersecurity front? Uh, so, so, big questions. Um, you know, I think the, um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to get into talking about Trump and, and um, uh, Flynn and, and, and Russia. I frankly don't understand exactly what happened there or, um, and it's not obvious to me that anything especially bad happened there, but uh, I think the, no the notion that the White House National Security Advisor to be shouldn't be talking with anybody outside the United States during the pendency right. of the but transition. The, the election hack is still an issue but separate from the Flynn. 
Yeah, it, right. So, so I, look, the, the, um, the fact of the matter is uh, nation states try to influence political outcomes in other nation states. I mean, that's, that's been true for a long time. Uh, the way the Russians went about it in, in this case uh, is w offensive to all of us. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think the, the fact of the matter, though, is that what it says is we need to uh, define some rules of the game uh, and get on the playing field. And I think defining the rules of the game essentially means, you know, I don't think we want to be told, I, I don't think we'd be happy entering into an agreement that says the CIA can never engage in the dissemination of information in a foreign country designed to affect a political outcome. I just don't think that would be a treaty we'd sign very quickly. Um, so how do you? So in that context, if we're not going to have an arms, you know, ban, um, you know, an arms uh, uh, ban on conduct, you know, how do you how do you deal with it? You deal with it by calling out the conduct of the other side. You shine light. You know, how do you fight information? You fight information with more information. The founders understood that a long time ago. So, uh, so that that's that piece of it. On, on the military front line, let me just speak to McMaster, I, I, who I don't know personally, but I, I've known a lot of people over the years associated with the Army Training and Doctrine Command. And, um, you know, th those, those folks for my entire career in Washington when I've been around these things, you know, have been the thought leaders. Uh, on, on all of these issues. I think the fact that um, you, know, you have somebody who is a very sophisticated uh, macro strategist uh, like McMaster and comes out of that, um, out of that world uh, is, is extremely encouraging. And um, uh, so I, I but I, you know, I, I also think, frankly, Tom Bossert is extremely capable and you know, was a superb choice. Uh, so I, as I say, I think there'll be plenty of um, uh, you know, smart and sophisticated people engaged in this around the Trump administration. But do you think it portends a tilt towards DOD and NSA for cyber, for government cyber activities and away from DHS or not necessarily? Yeah, no, I, I, so I think the, you know, the, the, um, at the, at the end of the day, uh, what I think is unlikely to occur, and we had, we had a proposal in the AEI report, which we'll have something more to say about at some point, to, to move part of the NSA capacity to DHS in kind of a Coast Guard-like uh, um, framework. And, um, and, and the underlying thesis there is I think there are just limits on what um, American civil society is going to want to see happen in terms of intelligence and defense community engagement in um, these activities inside, you know, on, on American soil. Okay, um, let, let's jump to Adam, who's been sitting here patiently uh, uh, while the rest of the discussion went on. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Center uh, for New American Security. Uh, like Denise, they both were involved in preparing rather extensive reports on what the Trump administration should do um, this one focused more on surveillance. Uh, Adam is a former law clerk for the late uh, Justice Scalia, uh, as well as a Judge Brett Kavanaugh, who's here on the, on the DC circuit. Um, and uh, Adam, you can talk a little bit about this, the surveillance issue and the encryption issues, which I think are, um, are wrapped together. And I'm also curious what you think about um, some of the things I was just asking Jeffrey about the, the controversy the Trump administration finds itself in at the moment related to Russia, uh, related to its fears of, of leaks across the administration, and how those you know, short-term uh, pressures in the cauldron they're in right now might affect some of their long-term thinking on um, issues like encryption surveillance and so forth. Sure. So first of all, thanks uh, to Ben and to Hoover for having us here today and to all of you for attending. Uh, I was asked to talk about sort of our expectations for surveillance and privacy in the Trump administration. And to be candid, uh, there's a lot of conjecture in this. Uh, first of all, because these issues did not f uh, feature prominently in the campaign. And second of all, because, uh, as Jeff said, uh, many of the people aren't in place yet whose track records would give us an indication of which direction things are ultimately going to go. Uh, so we are left with uh, nothing to do but extrapolate from the data points that we have. Uh, and there are a few, uh, which I'll just quickly mention. Uh, the first and the most obvious, frankly, is that the administration campaigned on vigorous uh, counterterrorism efforts. 
and that is likely to lead their approach uh, to surveillance and privacy issues. And perhaps we'll see a moving away from the Obama administration's instinctive instinct to balance whenever a, a complex issue uh, affecting uh, na national security and civil liberties uh, arose. Uh, we've seen hints of this already. Reportedly, uh, DHS is looking at asking people for social media passwords at the U.S. borders. Uh, I doubt this will ultimately happen, but uh, the fact that it's even being mooted uh, suggests that we're in something of a new era here. Uh, another issue where there are a few data points is encryption. Uh, so the President and Attorney General Sessions were quite critical of Apple during its showdown with the FBI last year. Uh, on the other hand, and I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, uh, current CIA Director Mike Pompeo in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal actually spoke out against uh, a, a lawful access mechanism or backdoors if you come from that perspective. Uh, that said, I think on this issue you have to assume that the Attorney General's view is likely to predominate uh, given that it aligns with the F FBI Director and that law enforcement has such weighty equities here. Uh, on foreign policy, there are also some clues. Uh, again, the most obvious is the President's America First outlook. Uh, I think that should lead us to assume that we'll see a sharper edge in dealings with Europe on surveillance policy. Uh, but with those exceptions, as I said, the administration is largely a blank slate, uh, particularly until we know the individuals who will be working these uh, at, at the mid-levels mid of the bureaucracy on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so looking ahead to the rest of the year, I think we can safely assume that the administration is going to be reactive rather than proactive, at least until it has its team in place. And so that raises the question, what are some of the action-forcing mechanisms that are already sort of baked into the year's calendar uh, or lurking in the background that might force them to act? Uh, the most obvious is Section 702. As you all know, that's going to sunset in December unless it's reauthorized. Uh, that means it's must-pass legislation. Uh, uh, and there will also be a very visible year-long debate. Uh, the, the Hill is starting to spin up the hearings already. Uh, so the administration will have to stake out its position publicly. And I think we can safely assume that they're going to push for a clean reauthorization that leaves all of the existing authorities in place. And with Republican majorities in Congress, uh, they're in a very good position to get that. Uh, privacy advocates are going to uh, hammer on the sort of backdoor search issue, as they call it, uh, US person queries of data uh, acquired through Section 702. Uh, I don't think that's uh, likely. A ban on backdoor searches, as they call it, is likely, given the current political constellation. Uh, that said, I do think it's an opportunity for some more modest reforms that are focused on improving transparency and public confidence around Section 702. I can mention a few of those in the Q&A if people are interested. Uh, just broadly speaking, providing more information about the U.S. person queries practice. Uh, how uh, often is it done? How often does it actually return U.S. person data? That's something the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has ordered uh, account of already. Uh, the aggregate number could be public without doing uh, damage to national security. Uh, also mandating the appointment of a public advocate for the annual 702 re uh, certification proceedings in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, there was an a, a, a amicus a, a appointed for the last one, and she raised some weighty uh, constitutional and statutory arguments. I can see no harm in mandating that that be a part of the proceedings in the future, and it might have some marginal benefit for public trust. And there are a few other things we can talk about later. Uh, another issue that uh, could force itself onto the agenda, and Denise mentioned this earlier, is privacy shield and relations with Europe more broadly on these issues. Uh, now, even in a Clinton administration, Privacy Shield would still be facing challenge in the European courts and would still be in substantial peril. Uh, but the Trump administration's choices have the potential to either raise or lower that degree of peril, depending on what they do. Uh, so one example uh, that we've seen thus far, one of the early executive orders, this was on interior security uh, in the United States, uh, instructed agencies to apply the Privacy Act only to U.S. persons to the extent permitted by law. And this seemed like something of an afterthought because it was really uh, tacked on at the end of the order. Uh, this triggered an initial panic, as, the, as these things tend to do in the age of Twitter, that this had erased uh, the protections guaranteed to Europeans in Privacy Shield, the Privacy Act and Judicial Redress Protections. Uh, now, it didn't. Uh, those protections were enshrined in another statute called the Judicial Redress Act, so they couldn't be revoked by executive order. Uh, but it's unclear whether anyone was aware of that uh, during the vetting process or whether it was just a lucky miss, so to speak. We just don't know. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, Denise also mentioned Presidential Policy Directive 28, which, as most of you know, I'm sure, uh, requires U.S. signals intelligence activities to account for the privacy interests of non-U.S. persons overseas. Uh, it would have been a fair bet, I think, that the Trump administration would have revoked this in one of its early executive orders if you were coming at this and had to put your money on one or the other. Uh, Director Pompeo in the op-ed I mentioned did call for that last year. Uh, at the same time, revoking PPD 28, as Denise suggested, would have 
have serious and probably immediate consequences for Privacy Shield. And that may be why it's still in place. This may have been something raised by the companies in their early discussions with the administration, something that they were concerned about. Uh, we just don't know, but I think that's the safest assumption. Uh, now, in our recent report that, Jeff mentioned, that Josh mentioned, uh, two colleagues and I proposed uh, making certain parts of PPD-28 reciprocal, uh, that is, uh, asking that uh, other, requiring other countries to credibly promise the same protections for Americans uh, in, order to, in order to retain those protections for their citizens. And by credibly promise, I think this would have to exclude authoritarian countries like Russia or China uh, and Iran, where surveillance practices are not authentically constrained by the rule of law. And I think this would have several virtues. I mean, for privacy advocates, it would get Americans more protection from other companies. Uh, and in fact, if you can do that, what is the argument for not doing it? Americans' privacy should be as valued as the privacy of, other, of citizens of other countries. But it would also highlight to Europeans the discrepancy between the protections that US law provides and the protection that their own domestic law provides. Uh, just one example, Germany recently passed a law that's analogous to our Section 702. So it's for a on German soil surveillance of, of the electronic communications of people outside of Germany. And it provides protections for EU institutions, for EU governments, and EU citizens. But Americans are not listed anywhere. So there's no analog to the protections extended by PPD-28. Uh, most importantly, however, the, the, the biggest advantage of this reciprocity proposal for those who think that preserving PPD-28 is important is that in a Trump administration with an America first focus, this is the best chance for actually keeping the key parts of PPD-28 in place, I think. Uh, one last thing that I'll mention, which is not an action forcing mechanism, but I think it's something of a crisis, is the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which now has too few members to even take official action. Uh, this was a recommendation of the 9-11 Commission. If you talk to Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton, this was not a throw-in. They thought this was a, an essential concomitant to their calls for substantially beefing up national security capabilities. And it's very important for U.S. credibility in various ways. It's been a part of the case that U.S. officials in the last administration made to Europeans about the adequacy of U.S. protections for Europeans' data. Uh, so I think it's a problem, and uh, it, it may cause headaches for the administration down the road that this body has become moribund. Uh, so finally, I'll just mention a couple of sort of banana peels, things that the administration might be tempted to do, but they, but they probably shouldn't. Uh, one is this idea of asking for passwords for social media and things like that at the border. Uh, you can imagine the kind of backlash that that would trigger if that were implemented on a, on a wide scale and that it would trigger retaliation against U.S. travelers abroad. I don't really want to give other governments my social media passwords or my email passwords. I don't think you do either. And the national security benefit there is, is speculative and probably not worth, the juice is probably not worth the squeeze. Another is, the, is bringing back a bulk uh, collection of communications metadata of Americans. Uh, this is something that uh, Director Pompeo floated uh, in some of his past writings. Uh, I think that would also trigger a major backlash, uh, including among libertarian conservatives, which is a constituency that the administration is going to need for some of its other deregulatory initiatives. Uh, I think a better approach would be figuring out how to make the current system work uh, most efficiently and effectively, the current system where the companies are holding the data but the government can query it. Uh, so I'll just stop there and leave the rest for Q&A. Um, I just want to pick up on one thing that Adam was talking about. So the surveillance and the encryption issues are kind of related, it seems to me. And I'm just curious what you think in terms of the policy discussion we're having in Washington. Um, as I alluded to earlier, there's been this huge focused by the president himself in the last uh, couple weeks in his Twitter comments and so forth uh, on leaks, on information coming from places in the administration, at least anecdotally. Uh, there seems to have been a rapid increase in adoption of certain kinds of encryption and um, encrypted messaging technologies uh, among um, certain actors uh, in Washington, uh, you know, Americans. I'm not talking about e external actors. So. How does that impact the policy debates? Just do some of the what were previously theoretical concerns about um, encryption, surveillance, distrust, what people may be able to do behind the wall of encryption uh, become much more vivid for people on both sides of the partisan uh, divide? And, and what does that do to, to efforts to address some of these problems? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting and a, a good point. Uh, I, we'll see if the fact that people are now using Snapchat-like apps out of the White House uh, to, to communicate with their external contacts will affect their views of the encryption debate. I think one object lesson in what you're talking about, and this is something I've written about, is the leak of the fact that uh, Mike Flynn did talk with the Russian ambassador about sanctions. Uh, that is information that was presumably collected under FISA. U.S. person information collected under FISA is treated very, very sensitively by by U.S. law, uh, and 
that was leaked. Uh, and that's a, a big problem from a legal perspective. And so I think this, it'll be interesting to see how uh, both the civil liberties community and the administration respond to sort of the shoe being on the other foot in some ways uh, from, the, from that instance and from others. I think that the encryption debate poses a really interesting um, set of questions for the Trump administration because, you know, I think as um, folks have mentioned on the panel during the campaign, there were various comments made about um, law enforcement access to encrypted communications and the duty of Apple and other companies to provide access and those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, you know, this is a pro-business administration. And when you talk to companies about it, um, encryption is like one of those like do or die things, right? They just, they feel very strongly about it. And, um, you know, vehemently believe that, that it would be the end of cybersecurity for, for as we know it, if you provide some sort of access to, to encryption. We can debate the merits of that, but um, you know, I think that, that Trump will probably listen to that. So that leaves us with um, you know, options for providing law enforcement access really focused on law enforcement hacking. And right now, um, you know, the FBI and state and local law enforcement just don't have a ton of resources to do this at scale. We also don't have very good procedures, processes in place to, um, to sort of oversee this type of activity. Um, there are second order effects as well on the sort of marketplace for vulnerabilities and exploits and malware that we haven't really anticipated. Is this going to drive up the value of, of malware in the underground economy? H how does that impact the sort of global cyber crime um, um, domain? And then finally, you know, it also creates an incentive for law enforcement to stockpile vulnerabilities and not disclose them to companies who may be able to patch them, right? I mean, it, it creates that sort of incentive, um, which runs against the vulnerability equities process, um, which is an Obama administration process <coughs> policy. We don't know if that will continue under the current administration. Um, but those are all questions that I feel like folks have not um, spent an adequate amount of time thinking about. Um, so in the absence of providing um, access to encrypted data, we're going to have to rely on law enforcement hacking endpoints, and we need to think more about the impact of that. Let me just very briefly agree with Denise that, that the, 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 the problem with the backdoor debate is that it's the clipper chip or nothing, right? There's been this search for 20 years for some kind of halfway house. There is no halfway house. And so, uh, and, and then when you look at Clipper Chip, you know, that turns out to be pretty unappealing for a whole lot of reasons. So I, it, at the end of the day, I think it's something that you talk about and talk about and talk about. Uh, but, uh, but to actually jump over that fence and end up on the other side, I think is just very unlikely for practice, forget the poli for political reasons, but also for practical reasons. Okay, I know we have some, some uh, Senate Intel staffers here, so maybe if I can just ventriloquize them uh, for a moment. I mean, you could have a performance standard where you say the companies hold the keys, the companies the only ones with access, but they have to retain the capability to deliver the data in clear text to the government. Uh, and, and I think the, the arguments made in support of uh, Senate Intel's bill last year have been unfairly caricatured in some quarters. Uh, like the argument that bad actors will switch, right? Some of them will switch, but the many, many dumb criminals who are out there, probably 95% of criminals won't. And that dramatically reduces the problem set, right? The argument that other countries are going to do whatever the United States does. You know, I personally don't think China and Russia are waiting to see what the United States does about uh, the free technology uh, before deciding what synergies they're going to impose. Now, that said, that's not a dis dispositive argument because there are countries like Zimbabwe and other sort of tin pot autocracies that might just get into the United States slipstream if we impose some kind of mandate. But that's an empirical question we really don't know the answer to. Uh, and, and I agree entirely with uh, Denise that uh, looking at the FBI's unilateral access, ability to gain unilateral access is really important. In our report, we recommend that, that, that uh, Congress give the FBI more, resis, more resources to do that, but also resources to serve as a central node of expertise for state and local authorities, because there are more than 10,000 state and local police departments, and the Peoria PD ain't hacking into an iPhone on its own. They are going to need to benefit from the FBI's resources on this uh, and from the other, other resources in the U.S. government. Uh, Henry Hetker. Uh, remember a year or so ago, we heard that the OPM had been penetrated. Uh, its electronic wall had collapsed, and their excuse was that 
uh, they didn't have the Einstein system. Th this would prevent this from occurring in the future, but it was possibly on order. I wondered, did they ever receive it? What does is, what is spending look like for the next year or so in cybersecurity? Is it going to go up about the same? Uh, is there any outlook on all this? Spending has something to do with success, and I wondered how that looks. Well, we don't have a budget yet, so right, I think it's right. hard to know. But yeah, I, I think if you look at the draft executive order, the focus on, uh, Steve talked about this, the, fo the focus on upgrading federal IT is, uh, I think, pretty clear and something that a lot of people, everybody ought to take heart about. I mean, I think that represents a clear policy direction. I, I do think, I don't know whether that executive order as such will be, will be issued or when. Um, I do think the original one was pulled back the day after the immigration order or the day of the immigration order when somebody said maybe we should do a better job vetting executive orders, which I don't think it was a, was a bad idea. Um, so, um, so look at it in that context. But, 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 assuming, but I do think that that reflects a lot of pretty deep policy thinking. Um, so it would be surprising not to have some aspect of that. And, and that suggests both um, a more aggressive approach to procurement reform and more dollars as necessary. Uh, Thanks very much uh, for, for the panel. Um, three, uh, uh, three things that uh, were sort of toyed with, I guess, by the outgoing administration. Um, the uh, criti well, critical infrastructure designation of election uh, systems, uh, the splitting uh, the NSA and Cyber Command, and uh, tweaking the incident response uh, framework. So, you know, there was a lot of talk uh, at the end of last year from Mike Rogers, not the Admiral, but the former um, Intelligence uh, Committee Chairman, that we were uh, leaving our best players off the field because the NSA didn't have a sufficiently uh, <clears throat> authorised role in, uh, in incident response. I'd be interested to hear the panel's comments on where they think the new administration will end up on those three issues. Thank you. Uh, and this will have to be my last comment. So, I, I, of, of the three, I only have a view on one, as I expressed earlier. I, I think the um, getting the friction out of the process between our capacity for cyber response and the real and the the ability to bring that capacity to bear in real time uh, is just an urgent. You know, if if the lights were to go off in this room now and stay off for a little while, and I think I don't know whether that can happen or not, uh, but I think most people who are informed think it could. Um, if that were to happen and we were to find out in the congressional investigation six months later that it happened because we were in the process of negotiating a memorandum of a request for assistance from DHS uh, to NSA so that NSA could actually get on the playing field, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, at that point, you know, ought to be hung out to dry. And I think maybe a lot of those people know <laughs> that they, they wouldn't want to be asked that question after the fact. So I, I, that, I, I just think that's and an and immediate crisis, um, you know, that hopefully get addressed soon. I mean, on, I'll just say on NSA and Cyber Command, I'm pretty sure that the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act pumped the brakes on that and imposed various uh, requirements that would have to be met for that to be for that to be undertaken. Although I, I would question whether the, whether this administration would even be inclined to to do it. Having spent a little bit of time working in the Defense Department, I do think that there is definitely a capabilities and expertise issue with Cyber Command and you know if there is a split at some point it needs to be done probably gradually thoughtfully with milestones you know um, there just there are concerns across the defense community that the capabilities just aren't quite there yet to be a standalone. So um, I was told that at the end of the Obama administration, they increased the number of agencies that could get unminimized access to the 702 data. Um, in light of the Flynn uh, leaks, do you think that the Trump administration is going to relimit that to a smaller number of people or more formal access to request access to that unminimized data? So I don't know if people are aware of this situation, but there was, in fact, a, a directive at the end of the Obama administration that did allow broader distribution of unminimized, which means the names of Americans or U.S. residents in there might be left in the intelligence when it's sent out to other agencies um, more frequently than they were before these rules came out. I'm not sure the Flynn situation is a, is a, was directly impacted by that because it seems like those conversations, anyone who read them, it probably would have been immediately clear who the other, who the American was, um, who, who was involved or at least what group he was part of. Um, but it does raise the question of whether, uh, once again, now we have too much, you know, uh, insufficient stovepiping and too much information being 
um, shared around uh, on that front. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, my understanding about. is that now the difference is that the minimization obligation now falls on the agencies that receive the unminimized data. It doesn't fundamentally change the rules about what has to be minimized and what can be left unminimized. And in the Flynn situation, presumably there was a, a valid foreign intelligence purpose for disseminating the U.S. person's identity in sort of unmasked form, um, obviously only to people who had a specific need to see that for their, for their functions. Uh, so I don't think that would, that would have been affected by that. There is one other angle on that, though, that any time you increase the number of people who have access to the information, when you have an issue where it gets released publicly, um, you have a larger potential pool of suspects, which can make figuring out who, uh, who was involved in disclosing it um, more, more complicated, uh, potentially. But, um, other questions? Yeah. Uh, first, Harper Shikapa, thank you for putting this together. It's really a great thing you guys are doing because of the how significant the issue is. Uh, I guess my question is, we heard the introduction that Steve gave, and I don't know if you guys were here for that, and he sort of laid out what it seemed to be a, from a, a sort of reasonable perspective from the private sector's understanding how to go forward. So my question is for you guys is, where do you see the three or four issues that you think that there will be consensus to move forward in the cyberspace that you would support and would want the uh, this administration to make us a focus. I think you guys had cumulatively about 280 recommendations in your two reports. So can you boil it down to three or four or one? It's actually, you know, it's, it's, I think it's on procurement and how the federal government procures the technology um, to secure its own networks. I think that there is certainly appetite to use managed services, to outsource, and to do less of, um, you know, the government's own cybersecurity by itself. And I, I do think that there will be an alignment of industry interests with, uh, with government interests there. So is it, do you say supply chain is something you'd like to see focused on? In addition to the term? I do think that, but supply chain is, is one of those issues where I think the industry is split. So if the question is where does industry see sort of eye to eye with the administration, I'm not sure that, that supply chain is, is quite ripe for that um, because you know American companies are seeking to get access to the China market to the European market to the Asia Pacific market and um, you know if we can if we're you know restricting the ability of companies like Huawei and ZTE to do business in the United States it may be that that the Chinese will take a reciprocal approach which they have you know they've, they've, they've done things like that so I think that Companies are a little bit split on this. Um, I have my personal views on it, but you know. I'll just offer one from the surveillance privacy perspective, and that's uh, relations with Europe, and more specifically, making our case better in Europe that we have a robust system of law and oversight in place, which we do. Uh, and the companies themselves will not say this, but uh, in public. But in private, they will say that they would be happy to have the administration being an amicable yet firm bad cop on these issues. The fundamental problem is that the people responsible for privacy in Europe do not have any obligation to talk to, or desire to talk to the people responsible for security in Europe. Uh, and so you have these two halves of the brain that are not connected by anything. And th so they feel free to prosecute us for our supposed privacy failures without acknowledging or accounting for the fact that in many ways they're in law laws and institutions are inferior to the comparable laws and institutions we have. I mentioned the Germany example from before, where EU institutions and citizens are protected, Americans have nothing. Uh, but that is not widely known. In fact, if you ask Germans, they will tell you that nobody knows about PPD 28. You can ask yourself why. I mean, one reason is it's a presidential policy directive, but do we really think that they're that much more aware of statutes? I don't think so. I think the reason is that it was given as a gift. And it's human nature. It's one of those funny things about human nature that sometimes we don't really value things we get for free. And so maybe asking for reciprocity is one way to highlight much more publicly the discrepancy there. And this could be very helpful for business because, as we know, Privacy Shield and its viability depends on whether US law provides adequate protection for Europeans' data. And that protection has to be essentially equivalent to what they have in Europe. And as we know, it is essentially equivalent to that, but how do we get them to take a, a cognizance of this and realize it? I think that's one way to do it. Thanks, uh, and again, thanks for the panel. So, um, historically, cybersecurity has been a bipartisan issue, uh, largely, it seems to me. Um, we have uh, this framework, 
widely supported. The CISA and CISPA bills, pretty much bipartisan. I'm wondering if, uh, with the election hack issues and some of the partisanship that seems to be coming, uh, pretty reasonably from the Trump administration pushing back, do you get a sense that we may be moving towards breaking down that kind of bipartisan nature of dealing with these issues on the Hill? This gets a little bit into the next panel's uh, area, I think. But what, what, since you guys are here, what, do you think there's a consent? Was there a consensus before, and is it like under under pressure or challenge? I mean, at least on my set of issues, uh, there there were some unusual cleavages before, right? The libertarian right and sort of the civil liberties left would align in these coalitions on privacy issues. The USA Freedom Act is one example of that. And on this as well, I think it's the, the parties are not monolithic. Uh, you're seeing a, a substantial minority of, of Republicans who are deeply concerned about foreign subversion of our democratic processes. Uh, and I don't think uh, they're going to be silenced on that anytime soon. So you will continue to see unusual coalitions, perhaps. Yeah, I agree with, with you on this. I, I actually do think that there's been some partisanship on, on cyber legislative um, um, initiatives. I mean, I happen to work on one of those where, you know, there are a very small group of Republicans that actually supported the, the original comprehensive cybersecurity legislation from back in 2010 to, to the 2012 time frame. Um, and and those, those legislative um, initiatives that, that really have seen bipartisan support are, you know, the, they, they were less controversial. Um, and to some degree, you could argue that, that, that the progress um, was, was somewhat limited, that they had less of an impact. Information sharing is important. It absolutely is. But if you talk to a lot of companies now, they will say, well, I'm not sure that we're actually availing ourselves of the liability protections in, in CISPA or CISA, um, various versions of, I, I don't remember what the final name of the bill was, I think Cybersecurity Act 2012. But, you know, I think that that's, there's a debate about that. So I actually have a question to try to connect this panel to the next one uh, very directly, which is, as you imagine what you think the, the administration is likely to do, uh, which granted is one level of speculation, uh, what is the component of that agenda that is going to end up inevitably uh, being requests for legislation? And how much of it is stuff that they're going to be able to do or try to do on their own? Uh, so. In other words, what's the interaction here that we should expect between uh, the Trump administration as it gears up and Congress as it gears up in this space? There we go. What would you encourage them to fund? What would be the funding priorities you guys would like to give to the legislature for the administration? I'll just sure. I mean, I'll just pull one funding. Uh, recommendation from our report, and it's something we mentioned already, unilateral capabilities for, for lawful hacking. I mean, in a world of greater encryption, that is, that is the only sort of, it's not a perfect consensus, but that's the, the logical end point uh, short of a government lawful access mandate. Yeah, I would have said the exact same thing. And on Ben's question, I mean, I would say it's 80% executive action, 20% legislation in my area just because a lot of these things are inherent presidential powers um, a lot can be done for a lot can be done um, to uh, reduce things that the Obama administration put in place uh, some things depend on nominations like the privacy board for example that's uh, com under the statute that, that's completely within the president's control uh, and so I would say it's mostly we're going to be looking at executive actions even on something like uh, encryption the president, uh, the, the uh, attorney general, and the Justice Department can take aggressive litigation positions if they want, uh, or they can uh, take a more pacifist approach with respect to industry on things like the All Writs Act, uh, should that arise again. I think this is a great question for the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> what would you encourage them? You know, I think I think that the lawful hacking piece is really going to be a focus of, of the next Congress. I really do. I think that um, law enforcement access to digital evidence is going to pose a lot of really tricky issues, and Congress is going to need to figure out how to appropriate adequate funds for that, how to you know authorize this type of activity or restrict such activity as needed, um, and uh, that's going to be a huge area of focus. 
And that, I mean, I guess they're also going to need to try to figure out how to talk about that, it would strike me, because just uh, it sounds like a pretty provocative, um, I think encryption may sail, sail over the heads of a lot of people, but when you start talking about hack, hacking um, government sponsored hacking efforts, um, even if you try to convince people that they're going to be directed uh, lawfully and at bad actors, I feel like in the environment we're in at the moment, um, some people are going to get very nervous about that very, yeah. very, very quickly. On the other hand, yeah, when, the, when the FBI bought the uh, solution in the San Bernardino case and the case went away, I think uh, most people were satisfied with that outcome rather than alarmed. I mean, the Justice Department is definitely aware of this. They use the term network investigative technique very scrupulously. That doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, though, like right. the rest of us. <laughs> given, given all the, the concerns about weaponization of information and the sort of controversy about alternative facts and all that sort of stuff, what I'm wondering is how you all see the uh, potential impact of concerns about, um, from a policy perspective, concerns about protecting the integrity of information. Um, and for example, you know, there was the old controversy between the Shanghai Convention and the Budapest Convention countries with respect to those issues and freedom of speech and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering whether, you know, uh, you see there to be more of a move to protecting the integrity of information, facts versus fiction, and what policy implications that might have in them. I don't think the conversation has gotten to the point where people are thinking in, in, in those terms at this time. Um, but, but I would, this does remind me that um, the comment that Jeff had made about establishing a norm on um, influencing elections and the, the, that we're really not likely to achieve that type of norm because the U.S. engages in that type of activity. I think that historically that is true, but in, in recent um, time, I, I, I can't think of cases, and, and maybe, you know, it's classified, but cases where, where our intelligence community has used fake news to influence an election. You know, certainly hacking into um, databases and, and leaking information, that sort of stuff. I'm sure it happens all the time, but in terms of actually injecting fake news, that's a whole new level of, of influence in terms of... Yeah, I mean, arguably, what they did and what made it so effective was that they introduced real stolen information into our media ecosystem, which, <laughs> for reasons that are hardwired into our media environment and our political system, was devoured immediately by everyone who stood to benefit from it, even many who didn't but couldn't afford to ignore it. Um, on the subject of establishing norms that people don't hack into each other's elections, I mean, for me the question isn't are we willing to forego that ourselves. Uh, we do not have to tolerate everything being done to us that we do to other people. I mean, we invaded Iraq, but that doesn't mean I want Iraq to, Iraq to come and invade us. One of the privileges of living in a great power is that sometimes your country can do things to other countries that they can't do back to you. And that's where I'd like to see us get on this issue. Uh, in terms of how do we respond to subversion and information operations like the ones we saw, it's very hard because of the factor, the systemic factors that I mentioned. Maybe there are some possible policy interventions. I mean, first, in the security clearance process, you could uh, force security clearance holders to use better OPSEC on their private communications account. Now that we've seen that this is a possible source of leverage, right? You can't go into massive debt if you're a security clearance holder. You can't have a drug or alcohol problem or other compromising information, or you shouldn't be able to. That's the point of the process. And perhaps also having vulnerable social media and email accounts is another vulnerability that adversaries could exploit, that the process should take uh, cognizance of. People should be forced to use uh, encryption tokens and other uh, high-level two-step verification methods at a minimum on their private accounts in addition to securing the information they get in their government uh, accounts. And also, I would hope that we have a strong societal norm, uh, or that we evolve a strong societal norm against exploiting stolen information for political purposes. Uh, for the reasons I mentioned, I think we're a long way from that. But you know, ideally, I'd like to see us get there. So on the encryption debate, uh, one of the issues is that all of us have apps or iOSs that require updates. And at that very moment, when we consent to that update, the entire, your database and system is at vulnerability. And for whatever reason, technologically and socially, we agree to give this trust to those companies 
but there is a technological argument that that's a front door access. It's not a back door. And that there is a technological way under the appropriate due process that we would be able to go to all these companies and your best encryption is purchased, but you have to upgrade your encryption. And those moments and when you do that, it's the same way at DARPA, there are many people who are very concerned of when you have to upgrade for viruses. That moment is when your system is the most vulnerable. So I just put it to you that this concept of a back door versus a real front door that we give to the, these corporate entities every set of the day is one issue. And the second issue is a lot of people are talking about making uh, software a critical infrastructure. Do you guys support the concept of software being a critical structure since it runs across all the infrastructure? No. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Um, it's the application of software to certain types of systems or assets or specific applications and implementations that makes it perhaps more critical. But software itself, I would never designate as critical infrastructure. Um, I just put it to that DARPA speaking. Somebody should, should steer them away from that. Um, <laughs> On the other question about the update yeah. mechanism, you know, that's a consent-based system, right? So you consent to the update. When, when you pick up your iPhone and it says there's a new update, it doesn't just automatically install. You have to put, press OK. And so that may be a front door that we yes. consent to. Yes. But so if you were to offer that, if law enforcement were to say, will you consent to our access, I think most people will say no especially the criminals, right? So it doesn't really work. I took the point you were making to be that the risk of key theft exists in that scenario also, and we view it as tolerable. Uh, and I think that's you know, an argument that, that, to be fair to advocates of a lawful access mandate, you have to take account of, right? Like the o iOS 7, right, Apple had the ability to unlock the phone, and it wasn't viewed as horrendously insecure. Now, there's some degree of additional insecurity. I certainly can't quantify that. I don't know if even people who are far more technologically sophisticated can. Uh, but uh, that said, having Apple hold the key and having you know the Office of Personnel Management hold the key are very different things. Right? Apple has a very good record on this, as far as we know, because it's an existential issue for them. If they leak the keys once and someone uses an Apple update to hack the phone and steal everyone's personal photos, they're done. The Office of Personnel Management is going to be in business no matter how many personal record, personnel records they lose. So I think there's a trust issue there. Does, do companies hold the key? The, the answer is yes, of course they do. And this issue came up when the iPhone, you know, the issue of the court orders and trying to get into the iPhones. Um, and Apple's argument was that they were being told to basically write an update that they didn't want to write in order to allow the FBI to get into the phone. But some of it may be mooted somewhat technologically. I mean, if someone wants to put massive encryption on their system, even if you have some updating technology. I'm not sure that you would, um, that just having a, another company uh, that, that, that runs the operating system give you an update would, uh, would, would negate that kind of um, uh, freestanding free um, software. But yeah, so some of these hacking solutions um, that would operate on a prospective basis are useful for intelligence services, but not for law enforcement when the user has been separated from the device and the only way in is through the physical device rather than through some kind of, some kind of uh, key logger or some other hacking tool. So for those companies that are under DDoS or other attacks, uh, what do you think about the possibility of uh, attacking back cyber self-defense uh, and trying to stop some of these uh, DDoS ongoing attacks that might last months or years even? So the hacking back debate, I, you know, I have personal views on this. Uh, it's a violation of CFAA and potentially other contractual agreements between you and service providers and, and um, owners of the machine, et cetera. But um, I, I think that on a limited basis, there ought to be some level of, of cooperation between companies um, and law enforcement to do this sort of thing. So I would advocate for creating some sort of like a pilot program for active defense in a similar type of way that we could get a pilot program to improve information sharing of classified threat indicators between the Defense Department and um, a select number of defense contractors that, you know, are building and operating mission critical systems. Why not think about extending that type of partnership to, to certain type of, uh, types of active defense countermeasures 
that a small group of companies under supervision could take potentially. I don't think that um, any company should be out there sort of hacking back, stopping the tech. Can I ask you a related question to that? Because you had mentioned earlier, both of you brought up this issue of FBI or law enforcement directed hacking activity, presumably going beyond just trying to open a phone, but actually getting into a network or a system somewhere that's causing problems. What are the parallels and the differences between that in the context of domestic law enforcement and the foreign issues we've been talking about for a while of you know, what happens when the US military tries to take action overseas to address a hacking and accidentally shuts off power to a hospital? I mean, um, is it a parallel situation? What kinds of, when you're talking about legislation, what kinds of safeguards are, are you know, can be conceived of to, to address those kinds of problems? Are the problems the same on the domestic front as the foreign military front? I mean, on the domestic front, you're enmeshed in our constitutional framework, which raises all kinds of issues which are really interesting and thorny legal issues that are, that are just starting to be worked out, right? Does the defendant get to see the source code, right? Things like that. That's obviously the military is not dealing with that. Another difference is that uh, FBI you know, network operations are information gathering. They're in a more analogous to espionage, cyber espionage, than to cyber warfare, which is destructive. One thing to think about in this context, though, is if we do authorize or we do resource law enforcement to, to hack endpoints, and if that's the way that, that, that they're going to access digital evidence, it's not just U.S. law enforcement that's going to go after the endpoints. It's every foreign law enforcement agency as well. And, you know, there's obviously the question of what rules will they be playing by and what kind of um, challenges that, that does that put on, on companies and individuals um, in the United States. The cross-border access issue still remains. Okay. Well, that is a great discussion. Um, I don't know that we've achieved great insight into what the Trump administration is going to do, um, but probably no more, no less than in any other um, in any other area, but at least we've, um, I think, set the table for um, what may happen or, as, as someone was saying, what, what should happen down the road um, in this whole cybersecurity uh, area. And um, I'll turn it back to Ben. I think it's going to be lunch. And then I see my colleague, Kerry Johnson, sitting outside for the panel discussion after lunch. So, uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn matters over to Kerry Johnson of NPR, uh, who uh, will uh, introduce our panelists <coughs> and um, and uh, uh, moderate the, the final panel. Carrie? Thank you so much, everybody. We're going to leave about 25, 30 minutes at the end for your questions, so think about them. Um, despite the fact that we have a hard stop, we, we should talk, you know, about an hour, a little less, and then um, hear from you all. Uh, quite a distinguished panel today. They're going to start out uh, with brief opening remarks, each of them, and then I'm going to direct some questions their way. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Hope Goins. I'm the staff director for the <coughs> Homeland Security, um, the Democratic staff. This year um, is a, going to be a banner year for cybersecurity as we embark on a new administration. I'll let my colleague, Brett, who worked on some bills that we had in our in, during the Obama administration discuss those bills, but those bills became law. And as we look at the Trump administration and what the Trump administration plans to do with the cybersecurity executive order that will be coming out in the next few days, we want the authorities that have been given to the Department of Homeland Security to stay intact. Um, DHS's execution of the Cybersecurity Act of 2015 has not been perfect, but it's on the right track. And with proper oversight, we can try to get it to stay working and to move in a proper direction. Um, on top of that, we still have lingering. that <laughs> There was um, interference into our 2016 presidential elections. Um, we do know that there has been evidence that Russia interfered into our 2016 elections. And the Democrats on Capitol Hill, um, led by Congressman Swalwell and Congressman Cummings, along with uh, Republican co-sponsor Walter Jones, are leading an effort to establish an independent commission to actually look into what happened in the 2016 elections and to 
try to make sure that it doesn't happen again, <coughs> not necessarily in, in 2018, but also throughout to see if it, it, to make sure that it does not trickle down to the states. And they're still looking for more Republican support on this. Um, that's the drumbeat that is going out from the Democrats that we are we need an independent commission, um, an independent bipartisan commission, select subcommittees and d getting this and committee investigations. They're okay, but they would still be pretty partisan. And we think that this that something this serious would need independence. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Bahar. I'm the uh, HIPSI, so the House Intelligence Committee's minority, meaning Democratic staff director and general counsel. And I'd agree with hope that this is going to be a banner year for cyber in Congress. And that's not a good thing. Um, if it's a banner year for cyber, that means a lot's going wrong. And we've kicked off the year with a lot going wrong with, the, uh, with Russia and its hacking into an influence campaign, because it's broader than just the hacking, uh, into the 2016 election. Uh, so that's obviously something our committee is starting the year off um, looking at in depth. And we, we are doing a bipartisan inquiry into the events and circumstances surrounding uh, that uh, active measures campaign that included uh, cyber activity. Um, but in many ways, clearly, that's not going to be the only thing that we're looking at in cyber. And the way I think about it, certainly for far too many industries, is that we're in a pre-Enron phase. If you think about Enron, right, what led to that were board members and senior executives at companies saying, it looks fine. If there's an accounting issue, call the accountants. And I think that's where we are still in many industries for cyber. It's a cyber issue called the IT folks. And what that means is I think, you know, we've heard panels on what's next in the administration, what's next in Congress. We're starting that in. But I think a lot of it's also going to be driven at what's the court, what are the courts going to do? And how do Congress respond to that? Right? What is a reasonable <coughs> level of precaution you should take to protect either your intellectual property, which could include your shareholders' value, or the private data of your customers. What is the reasonable standard of care? That's probably going to start to be litigated in the courts. Now, as we heard in the first panel, certain states are starting to step in in advance of those courts by setting certain minimum standards. New York is really taking the lead on it. I think it was just yesterday, the, the day before, Maria Vullo, came out and said, these are it. And I think if you look through those, it's a really wise model. It's tech neutral. It's incentivizing. It's setting a floor, but encouraging companies to, to do more. And that's another reason why I say we're in the pre-Enron phase, is those companies, those private sector entities that are going to go left of boom, that are going to start to take the precautions, they're going to start to build up their cybersecurity, their cybersecurity <laughs> expertise, they're going to start asking the right questions are going to get out ahead of the courts and probably going to get out ahead of where Congress can influence as well. But the other thing I would say about the way Congress shapes the field of, of cyber, and all of us here have, have really worked together on this, is right. So, you know, Congress can try to take a, a proscriptive approach. They can say, thou shall not do this. They can take a prescriptive approach that they, thou shalt do this. But what we found, for example, in the Cybersecurity Act of 2015 is what's really effective is to incentivize. How do we create the, the incentives, the atmosphere for better cybersecurity? So in the Cybersecurity Act of 2015, working with our Homeland colleagues, what we did, we said, OK, you get liability protection if you share cyber threat indicators, if you share malware. The idea being, hey, we're all going to be safer if we all know the pathogens out there. Let's stop hoarding them or stop thinking that it's going to be an antitrust problem or it's going to be some other type of problem. Let's get it out there and then figure out how do we deal with it. Those are the kind of things I suspect you're going to see Congress looking at more. How do we incentivize things, either through the carrot approach, which was the Cyber Security Act 2015, or New York took a little bit of the stick approach, said you must have this. 
um, you know, we'll talk more about NIST standards in the future. But this is, I just want, this is the way, at least from our perspective, we're thinking about these things. Yeah. So I'm Alan Souza. I'm a Hipsy majority, one of the Hipsy majority councils. Um, which I'm feeling outnumbered by the minority around it. It's unusual. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, and also, you're saying, I, I mean, I echo Michael's, Michael's thoughts. And for me, um, one of the things mentioned in the previous panel was that this year, one of the major <coughs> legislative pushes is going to be uh, FISA amendments at reauthorization. So, Section 702 is what we're going to be talking about a lot this year. And, um, you know, in the cyber context, it, when a cyber event or attack, however you want to define it, happens, it's important, especially against the government, it's important to understand who is behind the attack, right? So for us in, on the Intelligence Committee, it's making sure that the intelligence community has the tools they need to figure out the plans and intentions of bad actors abroad, right? Who is trying to hurt us from a foreign intelligence perspective? And so, you know, definitely, you know, some of the, um, the comments on the earlier panel ring true in terms of during the Section 702 debates this year, you're going to hear things probably like data privacy, um, data transference across boundaries, what is it, you know, the privacy shield, PPD 28, those types of discussions. But in the end, you know, it's important to recognize the value of things like 702 and that what it brings to the national security. So looking forward to the discussion. Great. Uh, so Brett DeWitt, uh, Staff Director of the Cyber Subcommittee for the House Homeland Security Committee, uh, work for Chairman Michael McCall. Uh, kind of look, looking at our um, action plan path ahead, uh, you know, our plan is to basically build on the cyber bills that we enacted over the last two Congresses. Uh, back in 2014, uh, we have passed um, five foundational cybersecurity bills. They were very foundational that really laid the, you know, the groundwork to pass the big Cybersecurity Act of 2015, working with uh, my colleagues here on the panel uh, to get that done. Um, and so path ahead for us is we got the authorities in place you know, clarifying roles and responsibilities for the interagency, kind of who does what. But what's missing now is kind of the, what underpins those authorities, which is the organizational structure and how do you streamline at DHS. It's currently an office, it's, um, but how do you streamline their operation to become more operational? And so we'll be looking at kind of meat and potatoes issues that are so critical to underpin uh, they're to be successful at carrying out those authorities, but talking about acquisition, procurement, how do you build, um, talking about um, a larger human capital pipeline uh, for both the federal government, private sector, um, hiring authorities, bringing people in the mix, making it easier uh, for uh, cyber professionals to come in and out of the government more easily to do the national security mission focus. Um, and so that will be a big focus. Uh, our big legislative approach is through a, um, establishing a cybersecurity agency at the Department of Homeland Security. Its idea is to elevate the cyber mission, um, prioritize it on the leadership structure, um, again, streamline the bureaucratic issues that have, have basically tied its hands and feet from being f fully operational. We need to um, eliminate those barriers. And uh, so it's just really building on the authorities that we've given um, over these last couple of years. Some of the highlights that we'll be focusing on um, is on, uh, it was Title II of the Cybersecurity Act is securing federal networks. Um, DHS runs the, you know, two big cyber operation programs, the Einstein program and the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation program. Uh, we're doing a deep dive right now into the, the six, how those programs working, um, what's broken, are they on the right track, how do we ensure that these large acquisition programs can continue to bring in new, innovative, cutting-edge technologies into the mix to secure federal networks? Looking government-wide across the entire federal enterprise, uh, there needs to be coordination there. Um, this is what the FISMA 14 law kind of dictated is OMB role is policy and uh, DHS carry out the operations for securing.gov. Um, so that will be a heavy focus for us. Uh, kind of covered the workforce issues. We gave DHS um, expedited hiring authorities in 2014. Those authorities haven't been implemented yet, which is, in our opinion, is kind of holding back the tide from bringing in recruiting and retaining qualified cyber talent. And again, back into building capability capacity to carry out the civilian cyber defense mission for cybersecurity. We, we need that talent. Um, other areas that we're looking at is a cyber executive order that we all have been anticipating. We've seen drafts of, um, and we've been weighing in on that. Um, you know, our biggest um, in message to the White House has been just the Congress has passed numerous cyber bills over the last several years that's ensured consistency with those laws, that's not contradict them or cause confusion 
of who does what and whose rules and you know different rules and responsibilities. We want more clarity, less confusion, and uh, that was what we've kind of messaged to the White House folks. Um, other big issues for us: cyber incident response. Uh, Presidential Policy Directive 41 came out over the summer that required um, the finalization of the National Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan. That was released. Uh, early January, so it's very fresh, very new. We're going to be looking at that, seeing, okay, when a major cyber incident takes place, you know, who does the private sector call? Um, how is that coordinated across the interagency? You look at, we call it the bubble chart, but it's basically the initial lanes in the road set back in February 2013 that says, you know, um, FBI, cybercrime, DOD, NSA is foreign, overseas, DHS is protection of critical infrastructure. Um, and uh, so looking at that and how the interagency process works is going to be key. Um, cyber insurance is going to be one for us. We're looking at market-driven approaches to address cyber risk management, um, kind of talking about the NIST cyber framework a bit. How can uh, companies, private entities uh, adopt that, um, and what can we do to kind of raise the bar for cybersecurity across critical infrastructure. 85% is owned by the private sector. Um, this is, these are voluntary relationships. So in order for them to be valuable um, or, to, to, or to be adopted, they have to be valuable. And so we're going to be looking a lot at the metrics to score the value of these voluntary products, the, the, the voluntary information sharing scheme under the AIS program, Automated Indicator Sharing Program, that was established by the Cybersecurity Act. Uh, metrics for ensuring actionable cyber threat information is being shared, quality assessments are being done, um, et cetera. So those are kind of key highlights, top points. OK, thanks. Uh, thank you to Lawfare and to Hoover for having us. Um, Brett Friedman. Uh, I am uh, the minority counsel for the Democratic side on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, so I also feel outnumbered, at least from the bicameral <laughs> side of things. But you're very, I hope you realize you're very fortunate here. You have two Bretts on a panel, <laughs> both of whom have two T's in their first name, which is unusual as well. So that, that's a, a joy. Um, I uh, <laughs> wanted to, I, I guess the, there, there's a couple pieces. Looking at it from the Senate side of things, it's a bit of a different optic. I think part of that is, um, kind of the jurisdictional quagmire amongst the committees themselves, right? You're speaking of uh, cybersecurity, which in a uh, discussion such as this is very centralized and, and easy, I get, to, to get your handle around what we're talking about. But at the same token, you talk about any issue in the federal government uh, crossing from the Postal Service to, um, to military to uh, just uh, public infrastructure. It is every committee has a, 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 an argument to make for them to have a, a, a play in this. So it's a much more difficult uh, proposition to get something substantive and comprehensive through uh, the, the Senate side of things. Um, so I think looking at the guaranteed, if you will, although that's a difficult, that's a tough word to use in this legislative world, but um, you have the Intelligence Authorization Act, the IAA, that's going to be put forward for FY18. <laughs> Uh, and you have, as was mentioned previously, 702, which is expiring at the end of December. Um, despite one's perceptions one way or the other in regards to having sunsets on provisions for Congress, I think there is there's, there's something to be said to say that <coughs> we know we're going to have to deal with this by the end of this year. You know, And it may be December 30th or the 31st that Congress all of a sudden wakes up and says, oh, God, this is expiring. But I do think we're taking a proactive approach from both sides and trying to look at it from the ground up, foundationally, what needs to transpire so that we're not in a predicament such as uh, a last minute type uh, fire drill, for instance. Um, I think just uh, to dovetail off of uh, what Michael was mentioning in regards to Enron, I think the part of the problem that I have in regards to under not understanding but um, dealing with cybersecurity, and I think this is more of a, a public perception, is quite frankly, um, you, you have um, uh, individual private citizens who un certainly understand as long as their phone works, as long as they're able to turn on the app, they're open their garage door, whatever it might be with the Internet of Things now penetrating other parts of one's life. Um, you, you, your identity gets stolen. It's a pain. It is something that you have to go and make several calls to various 800 numbers to make sure that everything's taken care of in bank statements and Social Security, for instance. But at the baseline of that, what is the harm 
to you monetarily? No, the banks take care of that. The, in, the credit card companies for the fraudulent payments, they're on the hook for that. So I'm fearful, and the way why, why I'm saying this is because I'm fearful that there's, until such time as there is something that is, um, that, that is quite tangible in the manifestation of what we mean with a cyber activity or cyber intrusion or a cyber event that is seen and visible and something that happens that the public is saying, oh, wait a sec, that is tied to, okay, I get it now, that we're, you're going to have a difficulty from a, um, a baseline perspective politically to really get the, the generalized um, bipartisan, which you need, regardless of the political um, uh, calculus now, as to get something through. Um, and the only other piece I'd say uh, on that, and hopefully this is generating some questions as well, is I think that our cyber security bill um, started things from an informational sharing perspective, but I think, and this is what I, I, I think the vice chairman would urge as well, um, Senator Warner, is more the moving that forward to a more um, a cooperative and a collaborative environment. It is one thing to have information sharing. It is another to have an, an, an open and active dialogue to really get an understanding of what is facing the private sector, how can government assist in that, and then working in parallel to get one to those ends. So I'll stop there. You've set the table brilliantly. Thank you all very much. I'm going to dive in with some questions. Um, based on some of the things you said, and then we'll open it up to the audience. First of all, I heard you say there are two must-dos, and that's 702 reauthorization and the, um, the IAA, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, both those uh, processes are open to amendments and also open to circumstances, circumstances like San Bernardino or a Sony hack or more revelations about potential Russian interference. How on the Hill do you prepare, if, or if you can, for one of those possible uh, game-changing scenarios? I think, I think one thing we do, uh, which I think is really good, is we started, for example, the 702 education process last year to try to make sure that in the calm of the day, people at least know and these are members as well as uh, you know, the, the broader public, what exactly is Section 702? What is it authorized? What are the safeguards? What are they, the trade-offs involved? So that if something does go wrong, it's not suddenly, oh my god, what is 702? Oh, let's just get rid of it and start over. So that, I think the education piece is really important. But that said, you know, when you start going into encryption or other type of issues, you could get an attack that does change the political dynamic, which could affect 702, which could affect provisions in the Intelligence Authorization Act, because those are subject to amendments as well. So one thing we're trying to do is education, but at the end of the day, you know, political dynamics can and often do change. Absolutely. I mean, we are at the will a little bit of current events, right? So even though we can sit up here all day long and talk about how we have to pass the Intelligence Authorization Act and 702, which 702 has to get done, I has to get done, but if something horrible were to happen tomorrow, that means a third priority, right? So we have to adjust our schedule. And like Michael was saying, with 702, we had the foresight to say, OK, let's get this ball rolling. Let's try to keep ahead of the curve, right? Um, I do think that it is worth mentioning, however, that um, at any point in time, the executive branch could come down and say, we want this as a priority, right? So it's also for us trying to understand, and again, like the last panel was trying to figure out, what is the executive branch doing? What, what are their priorities over the next few years? So are we, right? We have to get kind of guiding posts from them as well. So, you know, who knows what might happen tomorrow where the executive branch come out and say, hey, well, we want you guys to pursue X or we want to do Y. Um, so that very much applies to us as well. Yeah, Hope Goins, did I hear you make some news saying the EO is coming out in the next couple of days? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I said we are waiting for it. Okay. <laughs> I said we are waiting for it, and we've been waiting for it for, for weeks. Um, and we know what we would like to see out of the EO, but hopefully, and hopefully we'll get it soon, but we've been waiting for it. I'm sure plenty of people in the room have seen drafts in the press, but we're actually waiting for the EO to come from the executive branch. And Brett DeWitt, you mentioned uh, the, the succession of drafts so far of that EO from the White House and how it, it appears to have incorporated some changes based on feedback from the public and, and the Hill. Yeah, I mean, I would say where, you know, we first got indications back in November, December of direction, um, especially on, you know, 
looking at civilian versus military role for cybersecurity, there was a lot of angst, uh, at least uh, from our committee, on you know ensuring um, the important the importance of the civilian cybersecurity mission, and uh, um, and so initially there was that concern. I would say when the first draft was leaked, um, we saw that we we had significant concerns then. Um, the, the second draft that we saw leaked um, was an improvement to that, and I think it was good because these leaked drafts at least provide, in, you know, the outside provide input um, to it, maybe not as a, an official process, but I do think it's, you know, weighing the equities here and the importance of mission and roles, and, um, you know, I think that's been, been yeah, I guess, a good step forward. Um, we're still waiting for the final executive order like everybody else, so, It'll time to see, you know, what changes are made. May I ask Brett Friedman and the whole panel, to what extent or how would you describe the cooperation, outreach, collaboration you have entertained with the new administration? Are you in touch with Tom Bossard, who's the Homeland Security Advisor? Are there other people who are reaching out to the Hill or vice versa? What's the relationship like now? What should it be? I, I think it's in its very early stages. I think this is part of this is also just the stand up of a new administration, irrespective of party affiliation. Um, it's a huge undertaking to 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 gin up. I, I think you also have playing out, you know, the the unexpected nature of of what transpired in in popular perception and what that meant for an administration that may not have been necessarily putting the foundation in as to who was going to occupy certain positions. And you may have had another side of it on the other side that basically was ready to, you know, from the line person all the way up, uh, names, you know, uh, all, all the process essentially ready to go. Um, so I think that's, that's just simply mechanics. Uh, uh, from my standpoint, I mean, I would, Im I would anticipate, I mean, the Intel committees are unique in the, I think, in the bipartisan nature with which we work more, sure. we're co-located with uh, the other party. Um, and so there, there, I, I get the sense more of a very active dialogue with officials in the White House, particularly with regards to those administration officials in the cabinet that are coming through for nomination, right? So Mike Pompeo, next week we're going to ha be having a, a nomination hearing uh, for Dan Coats to be the director of national intelligence. Those pieces are really where the rubber's meeting the road right now in terms of our interactions with the administration. Um, Quite frankly, I defer to others um, in regards to, um, I have not personally, and nor do I expect necessarily to have, as the Minority Council on the Democratic side, an extensive dialogue. Um, but I, 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 I don't know how to characterize that. I, I would defer to you guys as to well, what engagement. Well, I would engagement. Say, um, from our committee, when Brett, Brett just mentioned that, Brett DeWitt just mentioned that we had some input on the executive order. Well, one of the input, some of the input that we had on the executive order, the, dra the leaked EOs, was in public when we had Secretary Kelly appear before us in testimony. Um, at other times, we have been able to have our ranking member and our chairman have had sit downs with Secretary Kelly to let him know the committee's expectations for cyber and cyber at DHS. So as of right now, the outreach from the administration has been pretty good, um, but like Brett from the Senate side stated, we're, they're just setting up and they're just getting started. Um, but it's up to us in Congress to still let the administration know our expectations, either if it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting from our bosses or through an oversight letter. Alan, thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So from the majority side, um, you know, Chairman Nunez has a relationship with officials in the White House, but one of the things we're looking for is having that staff level interaction as well. So that's something that, again, it's a new administration. They're still standing up, getting the right people in place. And so I think you'll be seeing more of that as time goes on over the next few months. Um, but absolutely, I do think that there has been at that top level that type of coordination and communication. Um, and I would imagine that same thing will happen eventually when the staff level, once they get everything worked out. So. And I would say the same thing. I mean, my boss, Chairman McCall, has had conversations with White House folks, um, Secretary Kelly, numerous times talking about cybersecurity issues and the chairman's priorities. Uh, so there's definitely discussion, dialogue, and we're collaborating. I know on the, um, our legislation to elevate the cyber mission to create the cybersecurity agency at the Department of Homeland Security, um, you know, full intention of collaborating with the new administration to do that in sync and in coordination um, so we can a approach it together. So um, we just need to wait for the new team to come into place, uh, the new senior leadership there. Um, but we're excited to work with them and to get that done. With respect to um, 
the uh, the Russian interference in the elections. Uh, Jay Johnson, the outgoing DHS secretary, had designated um, the election system's critical infrastructure. Moving forward, um, Hope and others, um, what does that mean moving forward? And do you expect this administration, or do you have a sense yet of this administration and its priorities for designating other pieces of critical infrastructure with respect to cyber? Well, um, in our hearing that we had with Secretary Kelly on February 7th, he embraced the idea of having elections designated, election systems designated as critical infrastructure. I think one thing that, um, one that when that designation was made, it's provide, DHS can provide volunt assistance to states that actually ask DHS for assistance. So it's not mandatory, yeah. it's voluntary. However, um, even though Secretary Kelly embraced elections as critical infrastructure, that very same day, the Committee on House Administration voted on party lines to actually abolish the Election Assistance Commission. Um, that still, that measure has not been brought to the House floor. However, given what happened in the 2016 election, um, it seems as if we would still need the Election Assistance Commission and that uh, designating elections as critical infrastructure is a step in the right direction. Um, I do believe that I mean, that it's a pretty partisan issue because states, and you have to be a little wary of it because states really feel as if the federal government is encroaching on them. And my advice to DHS and in conversations with DHS is to ensure, and which Secretary Johnson tried to do before he left, and um, if Secretary Kelly continues to embrace this, this would be in our conversations that we have with the administration is to let the states know that this is all voluntary. This is not mandatory interference in their election <coughs> systems. Just to add and double down on that, I mean, it's exactly right. These are voluntary programs. Even before the election, 48 out of 50 states voluntarily uh, sought out the assistance provided. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. What we want to watch and be careful for is anything that's a slippery slope into a forcing mechanism or the federal government saying you ought to do this or shall do this. That is where we'll have issues. But if you look at um, across the other critical sectors, the 16 of them, they're voluntary programs. So what does the designation provide? It provides prioritization of security clearances. It creates governance bodies for organization during steady state through the sector coordinating councils um, and the sector specific you know, the you know, SSA sector specific coordinate councils and ISAC model um, under the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. That could also be leveraged in a way of like just regular steady state collaboration across the states. So there's a lot of good things, but you know, we definitely don't want to see any meddling by the federal government at the states that's, that's in the election process is to the states, and we wouldn't want to change that. So I we'll just carefully watch. I hear a big red line. Yeah. You know, I think that's. Um, I definitely agree with that. My only concern would be the more government interference you have within the state election systems, right, the more opportunities there are for foreign actors to get in and meddle with state election systems. So um, I do, I think that such approach is definitely reasonable. I would just urge caution and make sure we do so in a thoughtful manner if we go in and move down that road. Let me move on to, um, I remember getting emails, phone calls, a ton of outrage from former federal government employees who were victims of the OMB hack and some of the other recent hacks, um, which really, they got attention, but they didn't get as much attention as they deserved. How would you describe the security of some of these networks now? What is uh, Congress's prerogative in ensuring better protections moving forward? I think one thing that I could say on that is the cyber bill that we passed in, at the end of 2015 required audits. It's, it required that all departments and agencies poll their organizations and say, okay, for example, of your IT professionals, how many of them have the minimum certifications to be IT professionals? Those results have started to pour in. They're not good, right? I've not seen one above 50% yet, oh. right? So there's a lot of improvement there, and there's a lot that we can do on the Hill to really start pressing, say, no, we need to get you know, not only our actual IT infrastructure, but the people who are working those infrastructures up to speed. 
same on our supply chains and our procurement cycles. You know, we have to make sure that cybersecurity is factored into things like DOD procurement. Right? If we're not asking those questions at the beginning of procurement phase, then once the contract's already signed and you start building and then you suddenly say, oh my God, this is not cyber secure. Then you're trying to bolt on, which is not only not the most effective way to do cybersecurity, but it's also far more expensive. So excuse me. So these are the kind of things that we start to, to press on and start to, to really worry about. The good news on that is, you know, if you look and you, you know, look at organizations, private companies or the government, there are like glaring holes in the cybersecurity. Sometimes it's just, you know what, put a username on password on that. Of course that's not going to solve the 100% solution, but it's better than what you have now. And I think there's a lot of that. You said, okay, you don't have to have the most platinum standard cybersecurity, but you can certainly do more than where you are. We're at 49 or 50%. Let's get us up to 60%, then 65, then 70. All that will help. It's not going to be, we don't have to, the perfect can't be the enemy of the good in cybersecurity. And that's one of the things that we can press on. We can do through our Intelligence Authorization Act. We don't have to do big legislation either. We can start encouraging these type of improvements. And I think building on something else, another panel said, we need to start making sure that we are growing the next crop of cybersecurity professionals. Yeah. And we have, on the intelligence communities, the IC itself does a lot of grants to universities. So those grants should be also to encourage more programs in cybersecurity. A, a statistic that I think is really worth mentioning here is of the top 10 computer science programs in the country, top 10 of the entire computer science programs in the country, not a single one of them offers a single course in cybersecurity. So we're here. It doesn't take much to get to there. It might be a lot to get to there, but everything helps. Brett, to what you were talking about, you've already passed legislation incur encouraging um, DHS in particular to beef up its cyber workforce. What is the problem here? What can Congress do to goose the system? So a couple of things there, the three laws that we passed, it was the uh, uh, Cybersecurity Workforce Assessment Act, which requires a five-year, well, a 10-year plan and then a five-year, you know, action plan on how to get there. The Expert Hiring Authority, which makes it easier to uh, re recruit, retain folks. A lot of it has been just implementation of these laws that's been stovepiped. Um, this comes out of the DHS Chico office, the Chief Human Capital Office, where this is getting held up. Um, I know we, speaking with the transition team um, um, a couple months ago when we were talking to them about the work that we had done as a committee, um, that was one of the things that we had said was, you know, a, a huge opportunity out of the gate is to break that down so you can at least bring, start building the capability capacity. So I know it's definitely on the top priority list for the new administration and we've communicated. It's been disappointing it's taken this long, but that's, we need to put resources to, to getting that done and fully implemented. Do you all have the sense that the best minds out there in the private sector are disinterested in going into the federal government for ideological or other reasons? Um, I wouldn't say that. Um, I would say, actually, while I would like to see DHS attract more cyber talent, that the private sector is still having a, a few problems with attracting some of the best minds in this field, too. Um, <clears throat> I would say that, you know, historically, the federal government the benefits, the flexibility, the ability to grow are, are there and that's what attracts some of the workers. I would say some of the rhetoric that's out there now that disparages the federal workers and disparages the employees of the intelligence community is not good for recruitment and even though <clears throat> DHS has expedited hiring authority, just the widespread rhetoric of a hiring freeze could probably sway some, an applicant from applying, but just because they think that they may not, may not get hired. But I would say that the tone and the rhetoric that is taken against the federal worker could possibly be a deterrent to entering this line of work. But I, can't, I wouldn't say that the best minds are just being had by the private sector, because the private sector still has openings too. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, um, I used to work at NSA, and I can tell you the people there are absolutely incredible. I mean, brilliant people, absolutely brilliant. You walk into a meeting, and it's like, wow, you are so smart. I have no idea what you're saying. So let's <laughs> take it back a few steps, and let's let's do a chalkboard with stick figures, and let's let's work it out. Um, so I absolutely disagree that the best minds are not going into the government. They absolutely are, and um, I have nothing but respect for the men and women in the intelligence community. It's amazing the bright minds that are there. I mean, truly bright minds. 
And um, I think also part of it is, you know, you get to do stuff in the intelligence community you don't get to do in private sector. So um, I think you do attract kind of the fun, um, that fun aspect, right? So. Yeah. And it's the mission, right? In many instances, it's the people are driven to forgetting about the partisanship, just the ideological, the, the fact of, of doing something for your country. Um, authorities, uh, uh, abilities, encouragement to do certain things. Um, I think that there's not there. There, are, it, I'd be, uh, it'd be a challenge at least within the United States to be able to find those outfits that would allow you to do some of those things. Um, and I think that that outweighs in some instances the, you know, when you're speaking of the direct, the monetary, right, um, the disproportionate. Um, compensation that you that you see. So I I, I, I agree with Alan, and uh, I came as well from from Fort Meade, and um, it was always you know the 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 weirdest dressed person you know with the Hawaiian shirt, and you you would never want to engage in a technical discussion with that person, but you knew their IQ was through the roof, and it was just it was astounding um, and and quite encouraging and um, uh, fulfilling as well. Just to echo that, I, I would say exactly right. The national security mission is key, both for offense or defense, whatever t you know, side you, whatever you'll be on. To, um, but you just need to make it easier. Not everyone's going to want a 20, 30-year career path within the mm -hmm. federal government. That's a really and good point. so you need to make it easier for the federal government to circle people in from the private sector for five years, maybe go back into government, back to the private sector. You, that has to be easier. And um, people do want to serve, serve their country. To handle the national security mission, you get to do some cool things. Um, but I think that's where there's some barriers that need to be addressed. And if I may, I think that that, that actually comes directly into conflict as well with um, the current in procedures for getting your classification, right, Absolutely. for security. Yeah. Um, the, there's just been a direct lag. I mean, for instance, I went to a school called Fletcher uh, for a master's program at Tufts. And the majority of the students with whom I was in class with were foreigners. Is that a problem? No, I went to that school because of that cross-pollination. But then you get your SF-86, and it's just a question of, well, who are your close and continuing contacts? And then I have friends who are like, well, all of those people are close and continuing contacts. They're friends of mine now. Um, and that ought not be the, the baseline, right, yes, no, or instead of a three-month uh, approval, it's going to take three years, and therefore you're not going to stay around and, and wait for that job. So that, that, that is exactly needs to be encouraged, and that, going back to the private sector and coming back, well, God forbid you go to Beijing, right, for that, pri that private sector position. That's going to create a problem for the classification piece. So it's just, we need to marry those two up, because otherwise you're going to have uh, continuing long-term problems with regards to recruiting the best. Several of you in your opening remarks, and thank you for them setting the table, mentioned uh, the importance of private-public uh, partnerships. Uh, you've been trying to incentivize this for a long time now in legislation and hearings and questioning of cabinet officials. What more can you do in that regard, if anything? I would say the big key is metrics, it's showing value of the information being shared. Um, and um, that's key. I think that's the... DHS Cyber Mission has come a long way over the last several years. Um, it, in a very short time, it's impressive, but they have a ways to go, too. And while they have these, the functions that are outlined in the law that we've passed, um, when it comes to scoring those and um, it's really the, the assessments of how effectively are you carrying out those functions is where we need to, where we need to see improvement. And if you can show that and demonstrate that value, I think that's where you'll incentivize the private sector to engage more. The other last big key is trust. Trust is so important with the private sector. And, you know, there was a, several years ago a big concern of DHS being a potential regulator in the cybersecurity space. You know, my boss under Chairman McCall said that is not the direction we want to go. We want a trusted partnership between the private sector and uh, the Department of Homeland Security. You're not going to want to share information with your regulator or someone who can prosecute you, as my boss says, um, you, you need a trusted partner in that. And th that needs to continue to build. And they've come a long way, but there's area of improvement there. I know in March, out of the gate for us, those are some of the first hearings that we're going to be having focused on the importance of, of trusted 
public-private partnerships and engagement, um, and how do you work together? Um, because 85% of critical infrastructure is owned in the private sector, can, um, there has to be collaboration. And scoring where do the priorities need to go, um, what should the new senior leadership focus on, um, that's kind of what we want to cover out in the next hearing. Let me interject. One three-letter agency I haven't heard much about from this panel is the FBI. To what extent um, did the recent uh, court battles in California and New York um, implicate that trust between business and, and government? Yeah, that was a, it was about almost exactly a year ago. Um, and it really laid bare a seam that shouldn't, we need to close. And it goes to your previous question. There is a lack of trust, and it, it, it is, um, becomes very pointed with the FBI because they're the people sometimes you as a private company want to call in when you're cyber attacked, but they're also the people you don't necessarily want rifling through your stuff because who knows what they're going to find. And I think building, to, to bring up on Brett's point, building up that trust that no, like when your house is broken, you call the cops. You don't think about what else are the cops going to find. You call the cops. We need to get to that level of trust. And before he left, John Carlin, the uh, Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division, he was encouraging that. He was saying, no, you need to, to call on those folks. We will help you through this. But I think companies are going to have to get comfortable with that. You can, you can picture the board meeting in your mind. Do we call on the FBI when the general counsel is saying, we should call on the FBI? Yeah, but who knows what they're going to find? And they're going to maybe take our, our servers. They're going to take our, and how are we going to get shut down? Do we want people in you know, the windbreakers coming through? How does that look for business? Those are issues that we actually really need to, to work through. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I'm completely with what Michael just said. Um, for the encryption debate, though, I don't know if trust would have changed much of that. Um, I think there were certain red lines there that you know, the FBI had one position, the government had one position, and um, Apple had another. So I don't know if trust in those types of situations would actually help that. Um, I think, to me, it was that classic case of when people say the law is notorious for lagging behind technology. Um, you know, there are only certain, there's only a certain extent to which FBI and the government's willing to go, and Apple's willing to go. And if they can't meet, I don't know if trust is going to bring them together. So I don't know, maybe. But well, I do agree, the increased trust is important. I mean, the other flip side of that, though, is what you notice from actually reading the pleadings, too, it was very hortatory. It was people not necessarily making legal arguments right away, but engaging each other with rhetorical barbs, when really what is needed to happen is they need to get into a room, sit down and work through these things, not just with lawyers and not just with engineers in separate rooms and not with policymakers in other rooms, but really, as we found, because we've had those conversations, Bring everybody together. You'll be amazed, even within companies, having the engineer and the lawyer go, oh, that's what you meant? Oh, I thought reasonable meant something else. Really, it's different languages. And when you get them together, it makes a big difference. Yeah. That's what I would encourage a lot more of, rather than trying to you know, lob grenades at each other. Behind the scenes, uh, the messaging war was mm -hmm. quite hostile uh, exactly. yeah. with um, private sector and public sector entities uh, holding competing press conferences at the same time, um, featuring American flags and buffs of Robert F. Kennedy right. and the whole thing. So it's hard to imagine some of that heat gets dialed down to zero in the oven mm -hmm. in just a few months' space. Uh, d d well, I mean, but that's also something we talked about on 702. Now we're not in crisis phase, mm -hmm. thankfully. So, uh, for example, we've commissioned a study by the National Academies of Sciences. Say, okay, just as you did 10, 20 years ago now, what's your latest thinking on encryption? Is it the exact same thing as the clipper chip wars, or is that too simplistic? Are there areas? And, and one thing we have to sort of keep in mind with going dark, it's not just about trying to, you know, if you picture a pie chart with a wedge out that's dark, it shouldn't be about closing it completely. You'll never close it completely. The same way, you know, think 30 years ago when it was just telephone, right? What people would do is they would not talk on the telephone if they wanted to go commit a crime. They'd go meet in a back alley or at a restaurant. Is that going dark? Sure. Right? They did not use the latest technology. They used something else to evade technology. We're always going to get into that. The question is, are there things that we can do to shrink that space? Same thing in cybersecurity. You don't have to get all the way up here. But the more you're up here, the better. And I think those are the conversations 
that we need to have? Are there technical solutions, policy solutions, incentive solutions? What can we do to help shrink that gap? Yeah, and I think that it highlights, you know, sometimes people want to get on Congress not doing anything, but actually there's a lot of oversight, and Michael mm -hmm. said earlier, that doesn't result in major legislation. But it is bringing those people in the room and trying to figure out, okay, from an oversight perspective, how are things working? Where can we help kind of steer the debate and steer the conversation and bring people together? So, yeah, yeah absolutely. And if you, if you look at the uh, San Bernardino instance, which generated for our, the Senate committee, um, uh, an impetus or a direction from both the chair and the vice chair uh, at the time was we need to have uh, put together a proposal whereby there would be lawful ability to get at communications if necessary if you have lawful process. Um, now if you recall that bill never was in formally introduced but you better believe that that brought a significant amount of discussion uh, on both sides and speaking of bringing people to the table that was really the underlying rationale we need to have a dialogue here. One way of doing it is perhaps having a commission to look at the issue. The National Academy of Sciences, as well as other bodies, are <coughs> continuing and coming out with uh, reports. I think that um, in the end, getting the people together to talk so you're not in the time-sensitive or crisis uh, situation of San Bernardino. And, you know, I hope that Congress actually will proceed to something prior to the next instance. I'm not sure if that will be the case or not. And really, to that point, I mean, that's a piece of legislation that my boss definitely wants to um, bring back up this, this, this year, uh, working with Senator Warner, um, the commission, uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, the next attack, you know, if, you know, God forbid it happens, um, make sure, you know, that we are moving the ball forward and that we're not going to have a knee-jerk reactionary response when the, the next big attack takes place. We want thoughtful, deliberative, um, policy decisions informing where we go. This is a very controversial issue with many different stakeholders and equities in play. My boss frames it as a security versus security argument. It's not pri privacy, security, security versus security, national security and uh, security of commerce, your personal information, and all your sensitive data. Um, and so we got to think about it through, they're both important values, they shouldn't be at the expense of the other, but how do you do this in a thoughtful, deliberative way versus a reactionary approach? And we really thought that the commission enables bringing all the stakeholders together to provide Congress with very thoughtful solutions so then Congress can ultimately have a, a menu of options that it can decide because ultimately the Congress is going to have to decide path forward here and uh, but we need to inform Congress and thoughtful deliberative recommendations is the way in our opinion is the path forward. One last question for you before we put it out to the audience. Several of you, Alan in particular, expressed some concern about cyber hygiene and sort of, <laughs> as you say, uh, and this notion that people, just average people in their houses don't entirely realize what around them may be listening. Uh, the, the court case this year involving the Alexa device in someone's home and its possible use in a criminal prosecution. Do you think folks understand uh, how technology is invading their lives in some intrusive ways, and what is the role of Congress in educating and helping them with that process? So I definitely think you know panels such as this, and you know we're all just one person individually, so we can't do everything. But um, yeah. I think definitely education is key. Uh, I mean, when you look at the number of major cyber incidents over the past several years, it's astounding. You know, and don't get me wrong, the federal government, and private sector repel however thousands, millions of attacks a day. But you know, 2013, you have Target. 2014 was uh, Sony. And 2015, you had OPM. 2016, you have, you know, the election. So, and that's just to name a few. That's that's staggering you when you put said. it when you yeah. put it in like that in a timeline. Mm -hmm. And I think that the government is doing its best to try to put in place, you know, the standards necessary to protect government as well as the private sector, to increase education. Um, I know one mem uh, one notable thing from last year um, was the Small Business Association and NIST were trying to do more outreach to small businesses about cybersecurity. And, you know, this isn't just a big business problem, right? Cyber is, affects us all. Um, for me personally, you know, I have friends who are teachers. I grew up in a family of teachers. And when I hear about, well, they're cutting cursive out of school. Well, in my mind, that, first of all, drives me crazy to love cursive. But what are you putting in its place? And my mind is kids today, especially now with the Internet of Things, have so much access to technology that what are we teaching young people about how to behave online, how to protect yourself online? And to me, that is absolutely crucial. Um, so you know, how do you do that from a legislative perspective? I'm not sure. I think we have to make uh, strides and have those open dialogue, I think, and bring people together. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I know that especially 
being reactive is not the best way to do things. Um, so from a proactive perspective, it's how do we reach, you know, again, primary education? How do you teach people about how to act and, and what to do in cyber to protect yourself? Um, for businesses, you know, should you be holding, you know, war rooms every once in a while? Do a cyber exercise, right? Um, part of the problem is how do you react to cyber? You know, you shouldn't have the CEO just saying, oh, there's a cyber incident, let me get my IT guy. Um, so again, I think if you increase that cyber education on the front end, it's going to eventually spread out throughout business and, and the federal government. Michael, you were talking about pre-Enron, post-Enron. Yeah, no, I think it's the same thing. That's why at least, you know, a number of us are up on the panel doing this because it is so important to increase the awareness of the cyber problem and take those steps to promote cyber hygiene. You know, maybe board should have, like, like you know, I'm former Navy, every day we have the <laughs> We'd have the ops and intel brief, the operations and intelligence brief. Should the CEOs get that every morning like the president's PDB brief? What are the threats in my network? Just so that he or she sees that and everybody else knows that this is a priority that we need to care about. Are those the kind of things that we should be uh, seeing? And I think Brett made a really good point earlier, though, is, it, is this being driven home at the individual consumer level? And I think... As with the IoT, the Internet of Things, increases, that's going to happen. And it goes to my first point, a lot of that's going to be playing on the courts. Everyone's familiar with that famous case of that really hot McDonald's cup of coffee that burns someone, and they, right? But the, that big DDoS attack of, I think, it was August or September, that went through coffee makers, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the botnet went through the coffee makers. They are IoT, Internet of Things. Now let's say one of those, you're walking by one of those coffee makers and you get scalded by the hot cup of coffee, boom, you've got the exact same thing where people really care. The product's liability aspect of cybersecurity is going to drive a lot of this, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Right? A uh, chip in your pacemaker is going to go awry. Your coffee pot's going to spew hot coffee on you. Your car is going to drive off the road because somebody hacked into it or, or introduced something to the supply chain that made it go faulty. And then the courts are going to step in and say, what was the level of precautions that company took? And the company will then know in advance, hey, I need to take a certain level of precaution. I think that's what's going to drive it. Great. We are going to open up to questions. We have somebody going around the room with um, Mike. Hi. Uh, thanks. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about incentives. And I'd like to start by pushing back a little bit on your Enron metaphor. I don't think that's the right metaphor at all. In Enron, uh, we had uh, government appropriately standing in for the consumer against uh, really awful uh, criminals who are running companies. Um, cyber is entirely different. In cyber, uh, the consumer, the government, and industry, we're all on the same side. We're being attacked by criminals and increasingly nation states. We're on the same side with respect to this, which is why I appreciate Brett's comments about partnership. And because of the speed with which the technology changes and the attacks change, I agree with your notion that what we need is an incentive model. Uh, because you're not going to find any gold standard. It's, it's not like brake pads. It's not like product liability, where we can come up with a standard. And once you hit it, everybody's safe. The attackers look at the standards, and then they break into them, because they've got all the incentives. So I think you guys have done a really good job in promoting some of these incentives, the liability elements in the bill, uh, the work that's being done in insurance, which is taking off. But we have really creative incentives throughout the rest of the economy, in agriculture, in aviation, ground transport, good actor benefits in permitting and, and patenting, uh, regulatory forbearance, uh, and things like this. And I don't see the Congress really examining those incentives that we're using in the rest of the economy and trying to apply those to cybersecurity. Are any of your committees interested in doing that kind of work? Yeah, so I mean for us, I mean we had a hearing last March on on cyber insurance and it was our first real deep dive look at to how can you use, you know, free markets to kind of drive better cyber hygiene and better risk, cyber risk management. And right now, I mean there's obviously a, a growing cyber insurance market, um, but it has a in our opinion, just so much opportunity. The problem there is there's not enough cyber incident data for underwriters to underwrite the insurance policies. And, how, and so what we've been looking at, how do you get more of that data, those data points, to, 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 uh, to, put, together these, to put together these policies? And so we've been 
DHS has a working group, it's called the CDOG Working Group, that's been trying to facilitate this um, across um, this, the relevant stakeholders. And there, this is kind of where we're exploring is, there sh what do you do to grease the, those wheels a bit? And it, could it be limited liability protections for sharing cyber incident data to create a repository that's run by the private sector and everything, but to kind of enable that data to come, to come together and then use for the greater good to underwrite more better quality um, insurance policies. You look at the auto, you look at home, it's the same thing if you, like home insurance. If you have alarm systems, doors, you know, locks on your windows and doors, uh, you'll get a better rate. And we think that could apply in cyber cybersecurity. Um, if you take certain risk management efforts, uh, you get a reduction in an in insurance policy when an event takes place. So we think there's a lot of opportunity there. The, the private sector definitely needs to drive it. I think those are ways to do incentives to to promote better cyber hygiene. Um, but we're just trying to look at the what's what could drive the market into that area more more effectively, more quickly. I, I think in regards to your question, I, I would say yes. Mo most, if not all, members would certainly be interested in those types of discussions. I think that the underlying piece is okay. You have y your members. I mean, it, w it wouldn't be a, a, the committee's hipsy or sissy that would be uh, taking a lead in that regard. Uh, and I, I would be, uh, I mean, I think y the problem is you have this um, piecemeal approach, right? You would be looking, okay, what incentives in the electrical grid would be appropriate? What things in the agricultural market? There's not a wholesale of industry perspective. And whether that's driven from the private sector or whether that's something that one looks to the White House to kind of dictate, I think that that's really where that um, hole would be filled and then push Congress to think about this in a holistic fashion. Because I think there is interest. I just think that it's it's more in, in the machinations of the way in which the political system is, is structured. I have a quick question. Hi, Jane Chong from Lawfare. Uh, you spoke at great length about um, poor user cyber hygiene. Just interested in whether there's any interest in Congress when it comes to more concrete carrots and sticks for companies, um, software makers that manufacture vulnerability-ridden software, and specifically not products that we could we'd consider uh, conventional physical harm creating products like cars. Uh, I'm talking about computer system software. One of the things I've been looking at are cybersecurity ratings mm -hmm. in the sense that the consumer, whoever is buying that product, should be able to say, okay, I really, because of my risk assessment, I want a level five security and I'm willing to pay for that. Or if you're just, you know, of a very small business that you don't are not too worried about cyber criminals. I don't want to spend for a five. I want a two. That's not necessarily legislative, but it's something we are. I'm looking to see if there's ways to promote that because I really think we need that. We need to know what the level of cybersecurity is on a certain piece of software and hardware, so that consumers and companies, as well as the government, can say, "This is what I want. I'm willing to pay for it." and then having a market uh, determine those prices. <coughs> but other than that, you're, you're talking about mandating and the difficulty with mandating other than a mandate like you must use NIST standards is that it's going to change. The tech is going to change. The Cybersecurity Act 2015 was very conscious of being tech neutral. And that's, that's what you run into, being too proscriptive. You'll be out of date by the time the bill is signed. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> as was said on previous panel, the previous panel, like, cyber touches everything. Right, so how do you find that right baseline to go off of that could apply to everything, or do you need to look at every single instance which cyber is used and have different baselines, and that just is not workable? So I, I, it's difficult. It's it's a hard thing to do, but definitely it's it's an interesting exercise. I, I would say like the Cyber Enhancement Act that passed in '14, which was codified that the the collaboration to establish the NIST Cyber Framework. DHS is responsible for promoting the adoption of that framework. What we're trying to ask DHS now is, what are your metrics to measure the outcome? Who, you know, who's adopting it? Why? What's the feedback on that? How do you improve? Um, uh, how, how do you measure who's who's adopting? And it's it's um, it's a challenge on the on the metric side of the usefulness of that. And that's what we're trying to get to the better, more data on, really. I think Brett hits on another key point. The, the metrics are tough, especially when you're talking about private sector boards making investments in cybersecurity? Because how do you really, are you able to say to the board, this is why we need to spend X amount of dollars? Because you're trying to prevent things, right? So what's your return on investment? Well, all these things didn't happen. What things didn't happen? Well, things. 
thing that happened over there didn't happen over there. So trying to get the metrics to convince people to make sound risk-based investments in cybersecurity are tough without those kind of metrics, which are really difficult. But I know there are folks working on that, uh, using algorithms, trying to figure out how can we answer those basic questions? How much should we invest in cybersecurity? And there's some data points I was hearing recently. The investment that we're making in the federal government is something like what I've heard and only is 1% to 3% on security for IT systems. And I've, you know, I've heard this from some folks, but 8% may be a more appropriate expenditure. But how do you right. t say up in the front end, I want to spend that much more on security um, to prevent some, an, some, an unknown? Um, but it's, I think it'd be interesting to see what is the right ballpark, what percent of your IT budget should be on security. Is it 8% that I've heard or you know, it, more or less? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd throw that out there. Think about the math. It's 2017. In 2020, we're going to have near 40 to 50 billion endpoints talking to our networks. All right? How much would you invest? The complex, what we're talking about today is the here and now. How are we managing it today? We're talking all the good work you've done. The intelligence community, DOD, DHS, you've done tremendous work. But we're de dealing about here and now. No one's talking about where we need to be three years from now. I mean, we're going to get killed unless we take a, a legitimate look and start talking to the federal agencies about that, the state and local communities, the critical infrastructure communities. Yes, this is a paid-for political announcement by myself. But <laughs> it's, it's just, thank you. We, uh, so. we got to get to these two people who have been yeah. long-suffering. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Thank you for a terrific discussion. Um, you all represent and work for prominent legislators, and you assist in making law, and you also are very aware, most likely, of the public opinion because you're the legislators you work for are elected, et cetera. I was wondering about um, does the law follow events? In other words, let's say with the case of San Bernardino, would the American public feel it would be maybe OK that that area of San Bernardino had been under 24-7 surveillance, and so perhaps some information might have been gleaned that would have prevented the attack? And where do you stand on issues like that? And also really getting back to that maybe more abstract point, but do events drive the law, or are you trying to make law that is cohesive and as, as much of a surround as possible around these incidents? I'm not asking you to legislate that, but it's just always been curious to me, and again, that one question perhaps about San Bernardino, would that have been helpful or, or successful? And if so, maybe that's a very ominous and foreboding truth about the state of the world we live in. Thank you. So I think in a perfect world, I think that we would want to create laws that cover incidents that haven't happened yet, right? We, I think that is, is always the goal. I and mean, that's why, you know, when we talk about the Cybersecurity Act, we try to make it tech neutral, right? How can we make this so it can apply um, moving forward? Um, unfortunately, just the way things work in the world, it's that so many laws are actually created and put in place re reactively. Um, however, I don't think that is the goal, right? We don't want to wait for bad things to happen and legislate on it. Um, the trick with us, though, is trying to stay ahead of the game, right? What can we foresee three years down the road? And how can we, as, as staff, help our members understand, look, this is something you're going to deal with, not today, but two years from now, right? How can we go ahead and get, a, get ahead of that? And so it's, it's a tricky balance. It is. Um, but in terms of surveillance against San Bernardino, I am not, a, I'm not for that at all. <laughs> um, you know, I do think that the great thing about our government is that we do have the Constitution and we do have laws in place that protect the rights and privacy of U.S. people and people inside the United States. So, um, you know, I definitely think that's where the rubber hits the road. You can't mess with that. But, but open up to the rest of you guys. I do think that I agree with what you just said, is that we try to get out ahead of things. We try to um, <clears throat> get our bosses to advance laws before things happen. I have seen, though, when we are reactionary, because Congress can be reactionary and that can be driven by the representatives and their constituents, um, that sometimes we make mistakes when we go down the reactionary road. So if we make this law and advance this bill and it becomes a law based off this event, when the next event <coughs> happens, we end up having to undo the previous law. Or we put money into things and now they're not working anymore. And we've wasted taxpayer dollars. So I would say 
it serves us better when we get out of head, ahead of things, but there are times when we do have to be reactionary. But in those times, um, we still have to put a lot of thought into them to make sure that the next time something happens, we can keep this law intact, or the next time something happens, we aren't going and throwing a billion dollars into a place where we just threw a billion dollars a year ago. This is the. Sorry, and to combine both of in the last two questions, where we see all this playing out too is in the budget cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, to really do cybersecurity, especially for large, you know, defense programs or government at large, requires more than every year budgeting, especially if you don't know if you're going to get a budget every year. That's something that we really do need to change. We need to go back to regular budgeting at the very least if not going two years out, to really stay ahead uh, of the big problems. And I was just going to make the point, exactly, that's exactly why my boss, uh, Chairman McCall, has been pushing and driving this commission to, to study the encryption debate now, before that event. And he said multiple times, the last thing we want is a major attack to happen where encryption was used and we didn't do anything and we had an opportunity to. Um, and so get, to this point, getting ahead of it, predicting what may happen in the future. I mean, that's what we're all, doing, you know, national security committees trying to predict what that next event may be. Uh, this is a case in point of why we need to be thoughtful about this and deliberate now versus the reactionary after that event takes place. Um, so, and you know, I would say these panels work both ways, yeah. right? So, like, we're here to talk about what's going on, but the questions that you guys solicit yeah. are helpful to us to mm -hmm. think about as we mm -hmm. go back and talk to members. So. Hi, my name is Christopher Bang. I'm a cybersecurity reporter with FedScoop. Um, recently, there's been dialogue regarding leaks, primarily driven by the White House to the press. But one of the stories that's playing in the background over the last several months has been a case of a uh, defense contractor who worked with the intelligence community and compromised a very large trove of classified material. I'm sure you're familiar with this case. Um, with regard to the oversight capabilities of the intelligence committees, is this something that you believe the committee is going to be looking at this year? Um, obviously, Harold Martin is not the most notorious leaker in the, in the classified community, but is it time for Congress to look at the policies that are in place and the protections that are in place in the intelligence community and maybe reevaluate them? Because there has been reports of other individuals that have leaked classified material. And then a second unrelated question, because um, I'm just going to have two, is uh, <laughs> One of the things that we know from the declassified intelligence reports that came out of the election as multiple probes are occurring into the effect of Russia on the election is that there was an information warfare component to it. There's propaganda that went through social media. Now, this is a, a very complex issue that immediately runs into First Amendment problems uh, when you talk about trying to regulate what occurs on social media and propaganda. Is this something that you believe Congress will be looking at in the this year? And ultimately... Um, how effective can the government be in, in this regard? We live in a society that values free speech tremendously, but at the same time, we do understand that propaganda efforts are uh, directed at our citizens. Thank you. Anybody concerned about somebody allegedly smuggling, you know, reams of papers out of three-letter agencies for a 20-year period? Uh, <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, this is a, you're seeing it with an increase, well, it seems to be an increased frequency. Um, different methodologies used, different perhaps philosophies or reasons for having done it um, put forth. Um, I think from a congressional oversight perspective, a lot of the um, attention thus far, at least with respect to both speaking particularly of Snowden and Martin, um, is you have two instances, both involving contractors, both involving contractors with it happens to be same company, I think, just happenstance. But the fact of the matter is it, it allows for members to really take a look at what, what, it, what is the insider threat program? Well, how are, how, I don't think anybody, you talk, talk about First Amendment protections, that applies to the members and employees of the intelligence community. So just as much as you're, you know, perhaps one's thinking like becoming a member of the IC, you're basically giving up all of your um, uh, protections or, or, or privacy, there is a distinct line as well that the, the leadership within the intelligence community has to deal with simply to design programs to say, okay, how can we 
um, prevent or at least uh, have a risk-based approach to where are the most likely sources of future leaks. Um, but at the same time, you also don't want them to take a look at what is the last incident, right? Because that last incident is not going to necessarily dictate what the next incident's going to be. Um, so it's a very difficult piece. I think that on both issues, I think, yes, Congress is looking at them. I think that there's a difference between looking at them and putting together legislative solutions that are going to become law. Um, I, I think, I, quite frankly, I think you're going to have a lot of um, rhetoric, a lot of discussion, a lot of perhaps hearings and engagements. But I'm not sure beyond that where things go, because we'll scope it out and see first whether or not there's any. Uh, uh, specifically with regards to Martin, I, I, that's, I, I couldn't state. I think the, I can speak particularly in regards to the most recent set of revelations um, pertaining to the Russia investigation, as well as Flynn and so forth. And I, both the chair and the vice chair are vehement that the leak aspect of this is just as much concerning as well because of the nature of the oversight that we're conducting and the need to maintain those secrets. So where are those emanating from? Who's doing them? I, as to the, the prognostication of what that then means or legislative solutions, I, but I, I, it is certainly amongst the priorities that have been iterated to us as to a serious concern and just as much as the other pieces of what the ongoing investigations are within the community. And you want to jump in, I yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think the with the Russian uh, issue, you know, our chairman and uh, ranking member came out in late July, the 25th, and gave a statement, and uh, outlining kind of the full bullet four bullet points that they're going to be looking at in terms of the Russian investigation. Um, and you know, we'll see where the facts lead us. Um, and congressional investigations can take a while, so I don't know how long it will take. It just depends on who they interview, what they talk about. Um, we'll see. Um, but you know, regarding to the Harold Martin situation. You know, I think that as part of our oversight, you know, we would be looking into security practices and that sort of thing as, as general oversight. Um, you know, in terms of that specifically, I can't say, but you know, I think I do think that HIPSI does take a role in SSCI as well, and you know, providing oversight over the intelligence community, which would include how are you protecting our nation's secrets. So, can I interject for a minute? To what extent um, have you all committed to making public at least some elements of your Russia investigation findings? We have not gotten that far yet. <laughs> uh, we'll, again, we'll see what happens, but nothing yet. But don't you, don't you think it's kind of in the public interest, in a matter of supreme public interest, to tell the public? Sure. I mean, and, what and, you found? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You know, I know that for the Snowden report, we do have an, uh, an unclassified version of that. So I would, you know, I can't, I can't predict where it will go. I mean, it depends on the sensitive sources and methods. But um, we'll see where the road takes us. So, I've got a question uh, about the nexus of cyber and finance. Um, last year, 2016 FSOC uh, Systemic Risk Report, the first uh, issue on the list was cybersecurity. Um, recently in January, the Fed, OCC, and FDIC came out with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on cyber standards for large interconnected financial entities. Um, we've just seen what happens when uh, the financial system has a serious revaluing of assets combined with a uh, inability with banks to lend and finance each other. Uh, and I don't think you have to squint too hard to look at cyber and see some combination of physical and intellectual infrastructure attacks that could per present itself in a way that causes significant systemic risks. What are you guys doing in Congress to address that issue? Well, I think everything that we've been talking about is trying to get at that, right? One way that you can try to prevent that is through, for example, sharing intelligence, cyber threat indicators. Right? We need to move away from protecting that kind of information to uh, sharing that information. And then maybe companies competing over how best to respond to that, to mitigate that, rather than protecting what you have. <coughs> the other thing that we have to do is get over this culture of um, secrecy involving when you're cyber attacked. And this goes to a lot of these points. Mm -hmm. Companies don't like to admit that they were cyber attacked. It, there's a stigma attached to that. We need to move away from that because otherwise what hits one company within one sector is about to hit <coughs> the next. So all these things really are geared toward that. You know, there are so many cyber 9-11, cyber doomsday scenarios, many of which we've already been through. Right? I mean, what's bigger than going after our election system relatively successfully? 
But there are. I mean, you could bring down the, try to bring down the financial system. You could try to manipulate data, which is far worse than just protecting <coughs> data. That's why things like the New York regulations are a step in the right direction on that as well. I'm sorry. Just a quick like, comment, too. I say three points, I think, to hit that hard. One is uh, part of the, one of the executive orders, sec the Section 9 list, which is the most critical of critical infrastructure. It's a program at DHS. Um, it's, a, it's a short list of entities that have, would cause significant harm to the economy. And I think better collaboration with that Section 9 list and those entities is a, is a thing that there's area of opportunity for improvement. I'd say to your point about um, harmonization of standards and regulations, I think is going to be key. If, if every entity kind of goes off on their own, is that really holistically best for the cyber risk of the entire sector? So I think a little bit more harmonization across these different regulators, I think, would be would actually increase security. And then third, I would say, is on the ICE, um, information sharing side, is we pass through the Cybersecurity Act, the Automated Indicator Sharing Program, AIS, and I think the financial institutions, them being the most, they have the most resources to dedicate to automated indicator sharing. I think them being an active participant in this and ensuring the success of the program is key. So I think those are three areas that I think there could be better collaboration between the government and the financial sector. We have time for one last lightning round question. Sure. Uh, I hope you spoke about uh, rhetoric dissuading people maybe from joining the federal government. Next week you have Dan Coates hearing. So I wanted to get a sense, uh, you know, we've heard uh, the president say pre Previously, maybe having some type of outsider come in, do a review of the Intel community, uh, kind of dialed that back a bit, but still saying there needs to be some type of, uh, you know, look into to the Intel community. So I just wanted to get a sense, kind of broadly, uh, you know, a month in now, what kind of uh, relationship you're seeing between the administration and the intelligence community, um, and what kind of questions we might see next week for the DNI who will be leading all of that. Okay, um, Dan Coates <laughs> won't be, <laughs> Dan Coates won't be appearing before our committee. But one thing I can say is that, you know, the president believes that there should be some oversight of the Intelligence Committee. We do too. That's where we come into play. <laughs> we come into play um, through our congressional oversight. There are also independent inspectors general um, throughout the federal government. Um, we, at one point, they were, under, they were under attack, but now it seems as if that has been dialed back. Um, what I can say is that we do believe that there should be oversight of the intelligence com community. The, the oversight that was stated that, that you're referring to, um, I would not say that me nor my boss would have agreed with that person um, being in charge of oversight of the IC. But another thing is, is that as far as oversight of the IC, oversight of um, other federal government agencies, the, the, the federal government agencies, I think that Congress is important. The independent inspectors generals are important. The government accountability office is important. We have those checks and balances there um, to provide us with what the agencies are doing and what they're not doing. And right now, there seems to be, uh, there's a culture of trust there between Congress and the inspectors generals and the government accountability office. Um, as far as the rhetoric coming out of the administration, I do believe that that has an impact, and there's a Washington Post article that was out the other day, it has an impact on the federal worker. And I hope that once we do get all of the political appointees in place, they can help the White House along with that and ensure that their workers actually, their morale is increased and that the attacks that are coming from the White House on those federal workers are dialed back too. But are you all seeing uh, tensions between IC and uh the administration kind of dissipating or they're working together? Um, as of right now, the, the, I, I am not. I'm not sure if anyone else is here. I know that um, Ranking Member Rufusberger. Ru Ru Chip. Chip. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Used Council, to be Rufusberger. Yeah, yeah. Former Ranking Member Rufusberger yeah. actually invited um, the president to come to the NSA because it's in his district and to check it out and make sure and to show him the good work that's being done there. But I have not seen those tensions because mainly I deal with DHS and some of the NSC partners at the White House. But I have not seen those tensions up close and personal. We're going to have to end it here. Thank you so much to the panel. Please give me a round of applause. Thank you for your excellent.